This podcast is proud to be part of the Talk Sport Fan Network. Talk Sport. Powered by fans. Uh, a very good evening to you. It is Sunday night, so that can only mean one thing. It is extra time. The final word on the weekend's action and there's so much to get stuck into uh, tonight. It did finish, of course, Wolverhampton Wanderers 1, West Ham United 2, but that's the not the whole story at all. No wonder I've got the old VAO error apology repeat t-shirt on tonight. And i tell you what, we've got so many people wanting to come on the show to talk tonight that we're going to have to split the show into two halves. We've got so many people that want to come on to have their say. But we have got a great show. I promise you this is going to be such a fantastic show. And I hope that you're all going to join in in the chat as well. I have got uh, joining us tonight, really, really pleased and proud to have him coming on. We have Sky legend, Johnny Phillips. How are you doing, mate? I'm well, Dave. How are you? That's a very kind introduction. Well, mate, you've, you've been on the show a few times. We've done some in-person podcasts uh, as well. And, um, you know, it's great that you can come on tonight to uh, to talk about the uh, about the game. And you were actually working yesterday, wasn't you, uh, for Sky down at uh, Molyneux? And I believe you interviewed Gary straight after the match. Yeah, we. Uh, I was doing the... We were at Sky with the host broadcasters for the game. It was live around the world. So I was there just to do the pre-match and the post-match interviews. So uh, I spoke with David Moyes and James Ward-Proud from uh, Prowse, rather from West Ham and then Max Kilman and Gary O'Neill from Wolves after the match. Fantastic. And uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're going to get stuck into the game. We've got loads more fans that are going to come on. They'll probably want to ask you a few questions. But um, the mood after the game, Molyneux was quite hostile at the end with the officials walking off. There was a lot of anger. There was people around me literally spitting blood because of what happened. Obviously, uh, you interviewed Gary O'Neill. I mean, he was talking about it being a scandalous decision. Um, I think he was asked to leave the referees' room as well, wasn't he? <laughs> as well, because he was like, was... I'm not sure. He said he said he went into the referee. Um... I think they have to they have to wait for a certain amount of time before they're allowed in to see the referee. I yeah. think Calm it made it 30, yeah, 30 minutes. So he, he waited that amount of time and then he went in to see the referee. And then after he went in with the ref, he came over to us. Uh, he, he, he By a, a matter of seconds, he avoided the fine. There's a fine if um, the managers don't come out uh, after a certain amount of time to do the broadcast interview. And he was he, he was just inside that um, that time scale. So he went to the ref first, then he came to us. Uh, and he said that, you know, he wasn't in the right frame of mind. Uh, I think it works to that effect that he wasn't in the in the right frame of mind to get a full explanation from the referee. And um, there was a lot of anger in the tunnel afterwards that, that they're, they're, they can be fraught places at the best of times uh, when it comes to a losing team. But certainly this added an extra layer of, of, of sort of tension and testosterone in the tunnel afterwards. And, uh, you know, quite a few of the players were, felt aggrieved. Max Kilman in his interview, I, I always find him... Um, I don't know if bland. I don't mean hard this harshly, but he's quite a bland interview, and in that he's not a, a colourful character in, with a mic underneath his his uh, nose. But on, on this occasion, it was as it was it was pretty much the, um, the liveliest I've seen him in a post match interview. He was really really aggrieved, and 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 was really really forthright about it. And obviously, I think most people would have seen the Gary O'Neill interview by now. He didn't hold back at all. No, and I think that Johnny is a is a build up. Of frustration. I mean, when Wolves have had some really bad VAR decisions, we've not had any for a, for a little while. But Gary also made sort of, uh, I think he made reference to the fact that David Moyes and even Fabrianski uh, didn't even think it should have been disallowed as well. From what I've, from what I've kind of read, is that is that right or was it just? Yeah, no. He said he said it was a scandalous decision, and he said uh, he said that Moyes and Fabianski agreed with him. We'll have to take his word for that. They, they, they didn't say it was scandalous in the um, in the. Moyes didn't describe it as a scandalous decision. I think he had some sympathy. I think from memory, he did have some sympathy with Gary O'Neill in when he was um, speaking in his post match interview about the decision. Um, I know he showed. I, I think David Moyes deserves a bit of credit. He showed a bit of restraint uh, in terms of helping 
the Wolves coaching staff not get themselves in too much trouble on the touchline. And then I think he pointed out to Gary O'Neill, there was a couple of players surrounding the ref at full time that needed to be pulled away. So I think Moyes was very helpful to the Wolves bench. Um, you know, it, it, it was a really, really tough one to take um, for Gary O'Neill. And he, he was just in no mood to be diplomatic about the situation in his interview, was he? Well, absolutely not. There's a, a, a question here that I just want to put on. There's loads of people that are commenting in the chat. We've already got well over 200 people, 250 people watching live and there'll be loads more watch it back. It'll be on the podcast as well. I mean, I don't know whether you do or not or whether you got a chance to speak to the referee, but Adrian Richards said, did you get to interview or even if you didn't get to interview, did you get to sort of have a few words with the ref? No, they, they they shut their doors pretty quickly and, and and didn't emerge. You can, you know, informally there are there are opportunities to chat with referees, sort of off the record, and uh, and they have chat. There are there are you know opportunities to speak with them. They, they, I don't think it was the right time. They were under a lot of pressure yesterday. Uh, it was it was quite a hostile moment. I don't think that would have been the time to approach them. Um, maybe in a week or two down the line, if I bump into one of them again, I, I could have a chat with them. Um, they're always keen to explain their decisions and they're always keen uh, for openness and integrity and honesty um, as, as they see it. So I think probably later down the line, if I, if I do bump into any of them, I might have a chance to just chat about it when, when the dust has settled. Because I think it's still quite raw, Dave. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just over 24 hours since it's happened. And I think, I think emotions are probably still running quite high from a Wolves perspective anyway. Well, definitely quite high. Uh, you know, I think, you know, as, uh, as Wolves fans, we, we've had a lot that's happened this year in terms of VAR, um, some really bad ones. But like the keeper, I mean, the, someone pointed out on, on Twitter or X, the uh, pop star formerly known as Twitter, um, about Antonio backing into um, um, Saar for their goal off the corner. And he was in an offside position as well. I know it went straight in and like obviously Kilman headed it in. But like... No keeper was going to save that header. And I was really surprised because normally when you, you it's an offside decision, it's black and white, isn't it? You don't see yeah. the referee go into the to the monitor. And the ref and when it comes up on the screen, as you're in, obviously if you're watching it live on television, you might get more of an idea. But in the stadium, all you get is a screenshot. You don't actually see mm. the moving part. You just see the screenshot that it's taken, but you doesn't you don't see where the ball goes, how far no. away it's from the keeper. Um you know, it was, it, it's interesting. You meant it's interesting. You mentioned that thing about Antonio. Um, I was chatting with one of the West Ham coaching staff who I know before the match, and we were just talking um, set pieces and corners in general, and how they've become impossible situations for um, coaches and managers to prepare for because so much is going on, and they're not entirely sure how much is being. Uh, monitored, what's being let go, what isn't let go. And because there's a lot going on, and we saw it, we've seen, I think we saw it with a, a Norwich goal against Leicester in the Championship last week, we saw it City's goal against Liverpool. There's tactical blocking going on, and the managers, all managers, as far as I'm aware, and coaching teams are preparing their teams, A, to guard against that, but also B, to do it as well. I think it's quite... Um, it, 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 it's common practice now to, to to look for ways of blocking, and it's just um, they say they, they, they say there's a lot of confusion within the game about what gets let through and what doesn't get let through. I mean that's a different issue to this one. Um, and in terms of the the offside, it's it was it was a strange one because clearly if you look at the image, you know the, the freeze, then our players in the line of sight is Fabianski. That's that's undeniable. So you know. Are we talking letter of the law? But then clearly, in, in terms of the spirit of the law and what happens, he has no bearing on on the goal. Uh, you know, Fabianski was never getting there. Um, the line of trajectory between Kilman's header and the ball uh, was not on the same line as the as the Wolves player who was um, in the offside position. So it, it's it's a funny one because it was called subjective offside. I think the it's the laws of the game that are the issue here as much as anything else. I think once the referee has been sent over to the monitor... Very player, rarely do they, do they stick with the yeah, decision. But to be honest, I think if you had a done and he'd come back and gone, do you know what, and I've watched it 
and like all of us have got like, well, the keeper's never going to get that anyway. No, you'd, have, you'd have sort of like put a lot of faith in more faith. Oh, well, they are using common sense, and I think sometimes it's like common sense. And from a Wolves fan's point of view, it's almost like they're looking to to find a reason to deny us the points. Or no, that, I think that no, I'd, I'd say that's nonsense. They're, they're, I know they're, it's nonsense, they're, but they're, there's a, yeah, I know it is. But there's a there is a feeling out there. Is they're almost they're looking to try and find a reason. Yeah, I mean, conspiracy theories are rife in football, and they don't help anyone. Um, there is, there is. I, I, I'd say there's probably subconscious bias to big names in the yeah. game. I, I think that probably does exist. Um, familiarity with big names, say for a team that gets promoted and and. and People don't know the players and don't know the names. And there isn't a relationship. I'd say there may be subconscious bias. There's no, there's no conspiracy going on. They are trying to do. It's funny. I, I chatted to a referee who's just recently retired, actually, and he said he, he laughs when he gets accused of bias because he says it's hard enough to do this job and try and get the decisions right as it is without, in the back of your mind, trying to think, oh, "I'll help this team out" or "I'll help that team out." He said he just laughs at that concept. He says it's so hard just to concentrate what I've got to do. I haven't got time to think about what colour, uh, what team is in what colour and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I'd knock the conspiracy stuff on the head. But I do think the problem with this incident may have been the law and not the ref. Because, you know, it, 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 he's, he's clearly in his line of sight and he's clearly in an offside position. But then he's also very clearly has no bearing on, on, on the incident. Um, you know, the, the, the header's going in, the header's in the back of the net before the keeper can move. So, yeah, before he even blinks, before yeah, he even blinks, yeah, you know, and the keeper can see the ball and he can see the line you know, with the balls going in, you know, but there is a player stood in his way. So, it's from the referee's perspective, does he go to the monitor, disallow it, and then risk getting in trouble for not applying the laws? He shouldn't or, be feeling like that, though, should he? He's, no, he's, refing, no, no. he's refing the game ultimately, and they've sent Correct. him because they aren't making a that they are obviously saying, Well, we think this, but we want you to have a look at it. You want you uh, to have that's, the final that's spot on, yeah. You're spot on there, Dave. So we could been, still ref the game and yeah, keep once, his it's, once it's been just once it's been decided that it's subjective and it's his opinion, then in a way, there's not really much need for him to change his mind from his initial decision. You know, he's, he had a perfectly you know, good view of the corner. Um, he doesn't really need to do anything. You're right there, you know. And that's the problem that VAR brings. It brings this extra layer of, of um, admin, if for want of a better word, that the, that the refs uh, have to get by. And if, 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 if there are controversial decisions being made on the pitch, then there are going to be controversial decisions made with VAR. So it's just leading to more and more controversial decisions. It's, you know, and, and, and ultimately it's the fans in the stadium who are suffering most of all, because as you say, they're not seeing everything. They're not hearing the discussions. And and that and that spontaneity and joy of celebrating. How do you, how do you feel about like? Obviously, we talked about this in a previous podcast where you were you weren't particularly in favour of Mike and the refs that that they've been doing a trial where you can hear the VAR thing but not the ref talking the other way. How are you feeling on that now? Because as fans in the stadium, it's so frustrating at times that you're just looking around, what's going on. If you're watching it on television, it's almost a better experience for the fans watching it on TV because you've got the replays running. And mm. in the stadium, you just get a still image and you're like, what's gone on there? Um, yeah, there's no, you, no real... On. Yeah, it's so frustrating. And it's something that surely in stadium for the fans that are really the lifeblood of the, of the game, the, you know, the, the fans that go home and away, the fans that season ticket holders... And then you stood in a stadium wondering, and you set with we're, I mean, every Wolves fan in there is celebrating, mm. a, you know, a victory, a, a, a draw, a, a point, a great goal. For about 30 seconds, we're all going ballistic. You're probably like going under the thing, like, come on, like this as well, you know, politely, because I know you're doing a job, but you're, you're a Wolves fan, so you'll probably go, yes. And then, like, after about 20, 30 seconds, all of a sudden you, you you see VAR come up on the screen and then there's this collective, oh, sorry. Mm. And, and yeah. then you're like offside and we're all like, how can he be offside off a corner? And, and, and then obviously you get a still screen and then the goal's disallowed. And of course, that then causes all of the anger at the end of the game. And then obviously it's been talked about, you know, on final score, on... Talk sports on on Five Live, 
on match of the day there's column inches being written about it you know then they refer you know they're talking about all the incidents that have happened to wolves this year and today of course we've uh, we've heard from the chairman jeff she as well he's actually put out a statement about it so what did you make of that yeah, I don't know. I don't know what purpose that serves, other than just to support the players and manager. Really, um, it's a you know, it's a public show of support for his manager. Um, it, uh, you know, after a couple of results that haven't gone Wolves' way, and after you know, the manager said a few things as well in the past week. So it's nice to see that um, that that show of support. I, I don't think it's it, it's anything other than that. I don't think it's going to lead to anything. Um, I think it's going to lead to law changes uh, imminently. Um, it's another. It's been another tough break for Wolves in 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 the season, as you pointed out. Um, but yeah, he's you know he's shown his support for the managing players there. Fantastic. Now, Johnny, we also want to talk about uh, an event. You put the first one on last year over at the Grand, which was incredibly popular uh, over at the Grand Theatre. We've also got. Um, Celebrating 50 years, I believe, 1974, uh, the Wembley Wonders. And we have got loads of fans that want to come on and ask a few questions in a second. Um, we've got the Wembley Wonders. Here's at the Grand Theatre um, that you're going. Do you want to just talk us through the, this and uh, the thinking behind it? Because you did one last year, which was very, very popular. And um, you've got a lot of the 1974 winning uh, squad that are going to be going to be yeah. there on the night and you're doing the interviews again yeah it should be good fun this one we've got um so it's 50 years since that 74 league cup final i think um, I, I obviously um it was before my time but i think for those old enough who remember it it goes down as one of the great days because it was again it's a great great city side with people like dennis law rodney marsh um summer b and bell you know he's an amazing man city side um uh, uh, you know, almost as good as the one now. And Wolves went out there and having Wolves having been in a quite a few semi-finals, been in a European final a couple of years earlier, finally got the win that that great Wolves team deserved. So we've got um, pretty much all the surviving members of the squad, apart from Alan Sunderland, who lives out in Malta. But we've got all the surviving members of the squad. We've got some uh, fans at the time involved as well. We've got some... Loads of footage that the players have dug out for us that we're going to be screening on the night as well. Is that like so, a little behind the scenes stuff and yeah, things like that? Yeah, we've got some nice behind the scenes stuff. So there'll be loads of little video clips and it's just a celebration of that event. But quite importantly as well, we are supporting the Wolves Foundation with this because they do a lot of work in the area of um, dementia support and combating loneliness. They have Molyneux Memories, which they host with some of the ex-players down at, um, at, the, at the ground, um, which in, in aid of dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, where people can come together and talk about matches that they remember when they were younger uh, and, and help trigger those memories. And also, you know, combating loneliness. It's a, it, a lot of people get together and it's their chance to meet and chat. So um, the Wolves Foundation have backed this night and we're raising funds um, with via ticket sales and other initiatives on the night for the foundation so it should be really really good good night and it's tuesday the 14th of may there are quite uh quite a lot of it has sold already but it's a big theater so i think there's still there's still a fair few tickets left as well so it should be brilliant well absolutely and the uh if you if you listen to us on back on podcast it is uh grandtheatre.co.uk forward slash watch dash on forward slash wolves dash wembley dash wonders uh, i've put it up on the screen there for you uh, johnny i've also put it in the description below the video so anyone that wants to get tickets it's going to be an absolute celebration of uh walls winning a trophy we got to the obviously the quarterfinals of the fa cup we don't want to go over that one again but like we don't win that many trophies it's 50 years since uh that fantastic day and it's tuesday the 14th of may um, it's a 7.30 start. There's already loads of tickets being sold. You do need to hurry, though, if you do want to secure your tickets uh, for the event. Uh, so please don't delay. Make sure you do get your tickets. And the link is in the description below this video if you're watching it back on Catch Up or if you're listening to it on the podcast as well. We'll put it in the, in the link there as well. 
Johnny, we're going to bring some other fans on now um, to have a chat uh, for the first half, to have a talk about the uh, the game. So just as a fan, we're just going to get you involved just as a, as yeah. a Wolves fan. Um, we've got uh, the voice of reason. Is This is Jack. How are you doing, Jack? You all right, guys? How are you doing? Hi, Jack. Yeah, how's, how are you? Because you've not been very well, have you? But you made it. Yeah, I've got a bit of a chest infection at the minute. I think it's this never-ending winter, in it? It's just kind of... All, all things coming at once, but yeah, so we'll, we'll keep soldiering on it as, as we should do. Fantastic. Uh, we've got Liam Berry, um, who is the son of Paul Berry, who you know very well. <laughs> Thank you very indeed. We were down in Cornwall the... last week, Liam. I was, I was. It was very nice, very windy. So I brought the wind back with us. Uh, and I think that's kind of what got James Will Prowse's girl. So I'm sorry on that behalf, but, um, <laughs> but, but yeah. I've... Fantastic. So no, so uh, Liam, by the way, um, Johnny, he is a, uh, a fan writer for us for the alwayswolves.co.uk uh, website. He uh, he writes articles on our website for us. He does a great well, job contributing. If on he's half all as good, if he's half as good as his dad, he's on the right oh. lines. Well, I'm probably some quarter at the minute. I'm I'm halfway there, maybe. He does a grand. He does a grand job. Um, from so, good yeah, stock, mate. Yeah, he's following his, in your footsteps as well. And um, we've also got Chelsea. Chelsea, Hello, how are you Hi, doing, uh, Chelsea? Chelsea's a okay. uh, hostess with the most. She was uh, doing the watch along yesterday during the game, um, and um, she had for for one one moment she had so much joy when we had that equaliser, and then the, you could just see the pain. Go over your face, Chelsea. When the uh, when when the when the VAR come and you're like, oh goodness me. Yeah, so, it's heart wrenching, especially because you're watching it in silence. It makes it ten times worse because you can't hear anything that they're saying on TV. So you literally feel like lost. You don't know what's happening until he went over. So it was very hard. Oh, so frustrating. So John, if you could just join us for the. Um... To the rest of the first half of the podcast, and then like we'll st we'll do part two with the other guys that are waiting to come on. Yeah, uh, we've fine, got mate. George, Lucas, Chris, and uh, we, we've got charismatic Craig as well, and cheerful Chris. We call him cheerful Chris because he's always grumpy. To be fair, it's always grumpy. Um, so and uh, so at the end, before we finish at the end, we'll be asking for your man of the match, your performance rating, and your highlight of the day as well. So have a think about that. Uh, Jack, what would you like to say? Because you've not been very happy. I've seen you on um, a couple of chat groups that are, you've been quite upset about what happened, and you're, you're you you want a little bit of a protest at Arsenal, don't you? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's got, it's got to that point now where I think it, it's just not good enough, and you know. We talk about stakeholders in the game, and I think fans are an important part of football. If you go back to lockdown football, where the stadiums were shut, all we heard from the TV reporters and everything was, it's not the same without the fans, it doesn't feel real and everything. And yet, <clears throat> VAR seems to be so anti-match day experience and so poor for people in the stands that have paid good money and time to travel and everything. Like, I just don't think that apologies cut it anymore. Um, just on the decision yesterday, it, it's a subjective offside. So as soon as it becomes subjective, the lines are so blurry and so muddy that it has to be completely and utterly clear and obvious for them to overturn that decision. And I don't think it is. Because yes, he stood in an offside position, Chirera, but that's not an offence. You can't be penalised for standing in an offside position. You have to have an impact on the play or the opponent and I don't think he does anything if he moved towards the ball or moved into the goalkeeper okay it's a different conversation but he does absolutely nothing so I think it's a it's a poor cop out from the officials to be quite honest um, the fact that it's a last minute equaliser makes it more painful um, if it was like in the 70th minute you've probably you've got 20 more minutes to get it back haven't you so then you've got a little bit more onus on yourselves because it's pretty much the last kick of the game that's what stings, I think. Um, so, yeah, I just think, you know, Howard Webb will come out and say this, that and the other and tell everyone why we're wrong and he's right and he's, it, it's just not good enough anymore. Well, we might get an apology, you never know. But what good is, I mean, it's not. It's like a loyalty card, isn't it? If we've had five apologies this season, do we get some points? Or I, I don't know how it works. We've, we've had four or five decisions now. 
we're very, you know, at the start of the season, we were talking about a potential relegation battle, weren't we? Now, can you imagine if we'd have been in that relegation battle right now and we'd have had five, six, seven points, maybe even more, eight, that, eight that, yeah, that we feel like we've been taken away by poor decisions? That can have a monumental impact on your season. And if you do get relegated because of poor refereeing decisions, Edward Webb doesn't lose his job. It's the people in the ticket office and the club shop that have to suffer. There's no accountability at all, I don't think, with these officials. You know, we saw it with Anthony Taylor, didn't we, when we had Newcastle and he made a ter terrible decision and they came out and said it's a poor decision. He got dropped to the Championship for a week, had a stinker, and the week after he was refereeing Manchester City v Chelsea. That's not accountability, is it? So I, I think we've got, we've got to start looking and thinking, well, you know, Jeff Shee's come out today, hasn't he, and said, you know, the PGMOL need to start looking and trying to improve standards. Edward Webb's been saying since he took the job that he wants to improve standards. There's no evidence that that's actually happened, is there? So I just think as as fans, we've got to kind of be saying, well, you know, we can't just keep sucking it up, can we? We've got to stand up and go, this ain't on. Well, and Jack, to be fair, Johnny, as well, because obviously it's good for you to sort of hear like all the, the feedback and I'm sure you see it as well. But Jack's quite a calm person. It's like we call him the voice of reason because he's very, he's normally, you know, you're very kind of measured. So for you to be upset um, and, and angry, it sort of sets the uh, the level of where the fans are feeling. It's just like it's us again. It's done. And you, 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 do, you do make the point right that it's kind of eight points. And someone out of many other people have said, you know, Forrest have had four points deducted for breaching FFP. Uh, Everton have had six. We've had eight because of, uh, of all these things. But uh, we would be six. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that tallies up. We've had eight eight points worth of bad decisions. But you're not adding up the bad decisions of teams we've played against as well. I think. I think it gets. Well, it's a fair comment. And I, I think once you go down that route, it could because there isn't. There, there's no Wolves fans sitting there adding up all the ropey decisions that the opposition Maybe had against someone us. Should. I think there yeah, was a VAR table that came out. We're up say, there, definitely. Yeah, you can't just say it's eight points. It's not because other teams have had bad decisions um, in the matches against us. Um, but you know, I, be, I get, I get the, I get the frustration though. I do get. To the be fair though, I mean, even Gary Lineker is like Wolves. Like last night, Wolves have had it really bad this yeah, year, and bad, they yeah. all talk about how bad we've had it. So I think we've had it the worst. And, you know, but you are right. There will be other dis other. Other clubs are, I mean, I know West Ham had a couple of bad decisions because, to be honest, the West Ham fans have been pretty good on the comments and re reacting to us and they've saying they feel really bad for us, but like they've had some bad decisions as well. So they kind of feel for us. Liam, what do you want to say back on that? I just, I just really want to echo everything Jack said. I think he said it perfectly. If I was to put it into words, I, I don't think I'll get anywhere near how exquisite he said it. So I think. It's got to the point, I think, if it wasn't for this season, I was I was for VAR. I was always saying, as long as they get it right, I feel like it's good for football. Because obviously they'd be eliminating all of the um, all the errors. But personally, I can accept human errors that's on the pitch. What I can't accept is that they're still making these errors with all the slow motion video technology that they've got. That's, that's just not on for me. And this season has completely turned me against VAR. I, I genuinely think it's doing more wrong than right at the minute because we can't celebrate a goal. I was on the phone to my mum when we scored yesterday and she heard all the celebrations. It was beautiful. And we ended the call and VAR comes up and it ruins the day. It's terrible. It's doing more It's doing more wrong than right at the minute. And again, I think Jack said everything perfectly. I, I, don't, see, I don't see any circumstance that they can bring it back really because there's nothing that they can really add to make VAR kind of echo kind of what football was before, how you can celebrate a goal, knowing that it is a goal. Um, yeah, it's just speechless, really. It's Interestingly terrible. enough, the uh, the Baggies game this year when we're away at the Hawthorns, um, it's Ooh. the FA Cup, we score the goal, the goal's given, you're celebrating, you're not waiting for a, for a thing, it was I'm real. Just, and, just okay, you know... Right? I'm, I'm not anti-VAR either. I mean, to be, to be honest, I've been kind of like, I think the goal line technology works really, really well. Oh. I think we've seen, I think we've seen like in the uh, the Women's World Cup um, and the Euros and of the 
the automatic offside stuff that they they do. Premier League have are, are opt, uh, opted a different way of, of doing it. You see them, don't you? In the scene, that worked out pretty well. There was not a, not a lot of mistakes made at the World Cup, but in the Premier League, it seems like we seem to still be having these issues. And the, 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 you're you're a young lad, you know, going to the game to, you know, we get you know we we have the pain. We have the pain, don't we? Like the Coventry game, that you know, it's so much pain getting getting a last minute loss. I mean, that was painful. But to get a last minute equaliser or a last minute winner and then be celebrating for thirty seconds, like you're on the phone to your mom because you're so happy, and then all of a sudden, and you're someone that's you know starting out as a fan, you know, young lad going to games and stuff like that, and it's killing it for you as a mm. as someone to enjoy the spectacle in the game. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, the Coventry, you can kind of accept that because we didn't play well and Coventry deserved to win. I think yesterday, the first half performance, I went to that game. I was really, really ill. I was cured by half-time how good we were playing. It was, unbelievable. Well. It, was it was so refreshing to see us play well again because we haven't played that well since we've lost the likes of Cunha, Neto and Huang, have we? We haven't had that vocal point up front and we haven't really been playing as well as we know we can. But it's when you lose a game where you're quite... You, you should be winning. I think, obviously, I think Saar nearly saved the penalty and the corner should never be going in. At the time, I was banging on about how someone's got to be on that back post, but watching it back, I think... I don't think he would have stopped it anyway. It was impossible. The way it went in and stuff like that. But then, then, as I say earlier, Antonio, and we talked about it with Johnny, you know, Antonio's backing into Saar to stop him from, yeah. you know, jumping. But, He's but, in an offside position, technically, but like... That mm. doesn't get pulled up, and and it shouldn't because that's part of the game. All well, this that's, that's thing, someone's it? dragging someone down. It's mm. a different thing, but like that's all, that's always been there, hasn't it? Yeah, with our goal, Fabianski was holding Chihuahua. He was holding him, and then so he let him obviously go. he was holding him, and he let go, and then Kilman's headed it. In no way, shape, or form is he interfering with the goalkeeper. There, you can clearly see by the video footage. If it if it was the case and he was interfering with play, Fabianski would have immediately started screaming at the ref. All the players would have as well. It was only when Fabianski saw the VAR on the screen that he started to pipe up, and that's obviously because he's got a chance and he's seen a chance that the goal could be disallowed and his team could win. If it was the case and if he was truly being interrupted, he'd be screaming. You would have been able to hear him in Molyneux over all our cheers. That's what would have happened. There's no there's no two ways about it. And you can clearly see by the videos, he's far away from the keeper. Personally, I've, 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 I don't think he's interfering. That should have, that goal should have stood. Um, absolutely. And Chelsea, you know, obviously you were watching it on the, on the TV without the sound. And, you know, I've watched it back today. And, it, you know, you did a fantastic job at the watch-along. You know, you, you just see your little face drop after the joy and that was how we were all feeling it's like what's your what's your take as a young you know female fan uh you go as many games as you can you watch it you know all the wolves matches what's your what's your take on on var where, where are you with it i think obviously as much as we want to say as a, if you don't like VAR, you want it gone it's not going to be going anywhere anytime soon i support it the goal line technology, because I remember watching that Frank Lampard goal against Germany in like 2010. I remember it and I went, that's what we wanted. I don't remember any football fan asking for VAR. And I completely agree with Liam of we can handle human error because we all make mistakes on the pitch. But VAR was brought in to remove that problem. But if you're having to slow down a live moment into small snippets it's not a clear and obvious error for me yes though how long it was taken to make the decision i understand by the letter of the law he's offside but the way in which kilman scored that goal it was going in a complete opposite direction of where the goalkeeper was so he wasn't going to impede the goal he wasn't going to save it and the eyesight he could see it and for me if you're a goalkeeper and you're an opposition player, you could say, no, then I'll just make sure I am standing behind an opposition player. And then I can use that if the goal goes in to say, well, he's blocking my view. Because if you've done it against Wolves, then you could make the argument next game, well, you've just done it to me. And I think that's the problem with subjectivity. 
if the game is so subjective, you've got professional players on match of the day, you've got people on here, people on YouTube saying, I don't think it's offside, I do. Then if the law is that subjective, the law has to be changed because I don't think the laws have changed with how VAR is being operated. And to me, why are you going over to a, to a camera to look at if it's an offside or not? It's not a difficult decision to make. You're either offside or you're not. And if you're having to look at the screen and figure it out for three minutes, it's not a clear and obvious error. But to me yesterday, and I completely understand with Johnny of going, there might be subconscious bias, but how that goal was checked didn't seem fair to a fan. And I think that's what all of us want. I know um, supporters of smaller teams feel like their, their team is not being supported compared to other players, just like that Liverpool game when we were just, the guy was just offside and they scored. As much as subconscious bias is going to be there, as smaller clubs, if we all feel the same way, we're not all delusional. We can all see there's a problem. And if VAR is not going to solve that problem, we need to pick and choose where it is. It was like that um, one with Emerson when Emerson touched tomato and people are arguing, oh, it was very um, a lackluster push or um, the foot was on the right heel of tomato, Isn't that right? If it was anywhere else on the pitch, you'd give it as an offside. You'd give it as a foul. Yeah. So that one's understandable. But this, the, the one for Kilman, it should have been a goal. It's too subjective. And if it's too subjective, they've got to change the law. Because if the oh. law is subjective... That means no one understands it properly. The game well needs to be as clear as obvious as possible. Yeah, well said. Johnny, obviously you're getting a taste of, um, you know, of, of different genres, fans of all ages and stuff like that. You can see in the chat as well. We've got 500 watching live. There'll be thousands more listen to it back. You know, I know that you're kind of like, you, you do a job, you do a grand job, you know, you've got to be impartial, especially when you, 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 you're there. You, we know you're a Wolves fan and, you feel it like all of us. But like all I can ask, what can be done, in your opinion, that you work in broadcasting, you, you, you see the reaction of players and managers, you probably have the odd chat with referees, you can sympathise with where they're coming through. What can be done to make it improve? To, because we'll, to a point, you're losing the fans. The, the VAR yeah. started to slowly lose the fans. And if you lose the fans, they, you lose what is the best league in the world, you know, yeah, it, it interrupts the flow of play as well. What no, can be done? Well, I mean, Chelsea makes two very good points there. The first one is about it's not going away. We are stuck with it. Now, if, if it was Absolutely. up to me, I'd just get rid of it. I hate it. I loathe far more than anything, just because of it. I think it's ruining it for match goers. So I just can't stand VAR. But we've got to accept it's here. Um, and the other point about the laws needing to change because of VAR's introduction is really interesting because exactly that scenarios that we've had with that particular Kilman goal, and maybe that Kilman goal will go on to be a case study in this at a later date, because there needs to be a way of the referee not being sent to the screen or either disallowing it immediately. Um, what happened then in that level of subjectivity um, and caused and, and, and that decision making caused by VAR um, at the screen needs to change. So I think I think rule changes w w or law changes, to, to use the correct term, are, are probably something that have to be thought about uh, to acknowledge VAR's presence and the fact that things are being seen from different angles or referees are viewing things from different angles, not just their own eyesight uh, at the time of the incident. And then I think the, the other thing is is the bar of the bar of interference of VAR. I mean, it's taken. It's taken other sports a long, long time to get into the position they want to be with technology. Uh, cricket was a shambles early on, I think. Uh, you know, you know when they first brought in uh, the reviews, and that that's changed slightly. And there's the whole like, umpires' call stuff. I think it'll only be over time that we'll iron out the mess that we have now, uh, and it'll it'll something that need need to be tinkered with over time till we get to a point where it's not interfering. Uh, and and ruining it, and you know you're all spot on. It is it is starting to ruin it um, for match going fans, and you know, IFAB and you know the, the games authorities have got to be really careful with this because they can't allow it to continue like this because it's just it, football's a really really expensive hobby for a lot of people, and a lot of people invest a lot of time and money in it, and I think they're being really really shortchanged 
by their experience with VAR and have been ever since its introduction. Absolutely. And, you know, the fans do spend a lot of money following their team. They spend a lot of money. You know, it's not just about the ticket sales. It's the petrol. It's the the, the, the drinks, the food. It's all of that that goes into it. Because, and because of it, because you follow your team, you obviously everyone's incredibly passionate about it. And the raw emotion of football is what it's all about. It's that, you know, the, the, the pain and all the joy and the celebrations, you know, it's all the moments when you it's like when you go to a game it's the moments that stay with you it's it's that moment you know the man united game when we scored the second goal in the quarter final of the fa cup to get to wembley you know you know the the tottenham game earlier on the season when we scored those two goals at the end um the joy and obviously you you have the flip side obviously with the the, the like the comeback against United, the late goal, the commentary, you know, all of that. But it's the moments that you celebrate. And if you, like, can't celebrate a goal anymore without thinking, can I really celebrate this or not, then it, you're losing so much out of the game. And they've got to sort that out. I know you can sit in the armchair at home and you can watch it and you can get all the, you know, the commentators and analysing it and giving the viewer. And that's... It has a massive global audience, and you can sit and watch it. You can see the reruns, and they can see. But the thing that frustrates me is this in-stadium experience for match-going fans is just unacceptable. It is unacceptable, and it's got they've got to 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 do something. Otherwise, they're just going to. There's people that are stopping going to football matches now, are not renewing their season tickets, or not going, or they're going to watch lower league games because that's more real to them and that's the the thing jack liam uh chelsea do you just want to come back on um what johnny's had to say there and then we'll just move we'll close up with the uh the ratings for the game um yeah sure i think i said on the watch long before i start everyone um you always say don't shout out the score but i always say as well we don't know what vr is going to say and that just emphasizes how how much VR is impacting our enjoyment because even I say we've got to check VR first before we can even celebrate this goal and I can agree with Johnny in that we need to see that change that being made to the law to make sure VR and the and fan experience is combined to make it work the best it can also I think one way to help fans and also people watching at home is referees being mic'd up? It works in rugby. I don't see why they can't trial it so we can hear what they're saying. Most people get upset or angry because they don't understand the process that's going on in their mind of why they're making a decision. But if we can hear that decision, whether we like it or not, we can understand it and appreciate it more. I don't agree with kind of like an interview at the end because I think that can be a bit more toxic. But if you're in the game, you've got the mic, let us hear what you're saying so we as football fans can understand your logic of the game and then we can move on. Because when we couldn't hear what was happening, that's what made us frustrated more. Because we feel like our game's being dictated to us. Whereas if we can hear what decision they're making, we feel part of that process. And I think that would help some fans deal with VAR better. Jack, your thoughts on that? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I like the idea in principle of miking up. I think there's football's very different to rugby, though in terms of the language that's used by the players and things, and I'm not necessarily sure that miking them up would work. Uh, and I don't think they'd go for it because that means they've got to be transparent and accountable, and I don't think they like doing that. I think they like being in their own little bubble and marking their own homework, if you like, and, and that kind of thing. Problem. That's the problem. Yeah, that is, that is, that's the issue. I mean, for, for me, you know, in, in terms of, you know, we're talking about um, an independent regulator for football overall, perhaps... PGMOL and the referees need an independent voice at the top, sort of saying, you know, OK, this is what the referees can do and this is what they're capable of. But also this is what, as supporters, this is what we need from you. And so whether it is miking up, whether it is a greater accountability, that kind of thing, whether it is showing the replays in, in the stadiums and things, you know, that's perhaps what we need. But just quickly, I think um, earlier on in the season, uh, Manchester City v Fulham, uh, Manchester City scored a goal that was very, very similar to the one we scored yesterday. Uh, I think it was Ake headed it in and Akanji was stood in front of the goalkeeper, made no attempt to play the ball, just stood there. And the, the VAR allowed the goal to stand. Do you know who the VAR was? 
Tony Harrington. So the same referee that was on the pitch yesterday. So two identical, well, identical-ish decisions. One's disallowed, one's allowed. So I think I think perhaps Howard Webb and PJ Mill need to take a big step back at the end of the season. And like Chelsea says with these rules and Johnny says with the rules, what is it that we're going to disallow? What is it that we're going to allow? What are we looking for from certain situations? Because it feels to me like they're making it up as they go along. And sometimes and there'll be a there'll be a controversial decision in, in a in a game involving one of the big teams, and all of a sudden, oh we'll penalise that every time now. And then after a couple of months, oh it's gone out of fashion now. And we're gonna focus on something else that we're gonna keep penalising. If you remember last year with Lamina, when he got sent off for being the third player running to the referee, yeah. and everyone went, Well, I've never heard of that rule. And they went, Oh, it is a rule, it is a rule. And then two weeks later, someone else did it and no one was punished, it's and then that not, kind of got a rule anymore. Yeah, I, I think, and, and I think this to... comes back to where the frustration comes because it's been yeah. going on. Like that, you talk about the, the the penalty and the red card against Raul away. The the Liverpool, oh, the camera disappeared. We didn't have an angle <laughs> uh, because the cameraman was, you know, in the FA Cup. When I mean, yeah. all of these things. And this is where the conspiracy comes from because it's <laughs> like conveniently lose a camera on the Champions League venue. For that game, it's like you know what I mean. We laugh about it, but it, it builds up over time, and that's where we that's where it gets to. Have you, Jack? <laughs> yeah, I was just, just going to say that that's kind of it, isn't it? Really, I think like we've almost like say making up as they go along, and, and it doesn't feel to me like they're particularly on top of themselves what the rules are, and and almost the expectation. You know, I, I'm not going to kind of go in on, on, on the kind of they've never played the game before. That's what a lot of people say. But sometimes it feels to me like someone who just understands the game would have looked at that situation yesterday and gone, letter of the law, maybe he is offside, but it's never offside. Never off. And and let's let's use some common sense and, and allow the goal to stand. And and I don't think even West Ham would have had been up in arms about it if it had been allowed to stand because... Like I think Liam said at the no, time, one of their the, players. I, were... I don't think any of the West Ham fans, West Ham players, or fans, or anyone complained. I don't think Fabianski really did, other than he, he, he you would like, like when they try and make yeah. an offside gesture, they would accepted it. And then the VAR comes. Uh, Liam, your thoughts on Chelsea's idea, and then to conclude this half of the show, if you can do your Liam or Windows man of the match, your Fox at Shipley performance rating, and of course your highlight of the day. Well. Entertainment-wise, I would absolutely love the refs to be mic'd up because you're hearing all the players swear at them. You're hearing everything. The, the fans are going to be reacting to every little word that's been said. Whether or not it works, I don't think it would. I think that would cause too much animosity around the stadium. I think it'd be 10 times more aggressive. But like I said, entertainment-wise, I'd absolutely love it. I'd go to every game. Even if the tickets were up to 10 grand, I'd go because it'd, be, it'd be so entertaining. Um but yeah, I think I don't think VAR has ever been this bad. I think even in previous seasons, they're just adding in these rules that nobody really asks for, and I don't think it's needed really. Because even before, you could kind of know what the rules are. They weren't getting changed every other week. It's like it was somewhat consistent. Even you'd obviously get the odd decision against you, and you'd obviously have a little moan about it. But it was a lot more. You could you could comprehend it a little bit more than you can now. Because right now, I don't trust VAR one bit. I think Johnny said it earlier on. We've definitely had decisions that have gone to, uh, towards us that we've been very lucky to have. I think all this talk about how we've lost eight points, that certainly wouldn't have happened because it's an emotional team. If the scoreline's different, I'm sure the games would have panned out in a different way. I, I, I really doubt that the eight points really is a accurate figure for how much we could have if VAR was in place. Um, but yeah, it's, it's most certainly never been this bad. I think it's getting to the point where... They've got to make some changes. And personally, I just don't see what they can do that can make the situation any better. I think I've, I've said it for a long time. They just need to get one rule book and stick to it for just a, just a couple of years. You know, you've got to stick to it because it's when it's when they change it. That's when we get a bit of um confused. It gets confusing. I'm confused every time I go to the games because we can score a perfectly good goal in my eyes, and then randomly something comes up. I think City game a couple of years ago, when they penalty the encroachment thing, I never heard of encroachment. When I saw the word was on the TV, I was flabbergasted. It was a new word to me. I didn't know what it was. It's like 
all the rules, it just makes the game so confusing. I wish they could just get one rule book and stick to it simply. And that's what they did with VAR previously. So I think it's just unneeded rule changes that does it for me and why I am like against VAR. Fantastic. And you say so you're man of the match for oh, you? Yeah. Um, do you feel, I want to give credit to Kilman. I do want to give credit to Kilman. He, I think he had a very good game yesterday. I think the one thing I would say is that he needs to have a bit more character as captain. When we went 2-1 down, he was just standing in the middle of the pitch. I was screaming in the family enclosure. He was standing in the middle of the pitch doing absolutely nothing. You've got to be encouraging the team because it's a young group. You've got to have a bit of support when we're losing. That's one thing I will say about Kilman. But performance-wise, I think he was really, really good. I think he had a really solid game and he seemed up for the fight with Antonio. And it was quite nice to see that because Antonio is big and strong, but it was nice to see that we had a defender that was looking up for the challenge. Um, what was the other one? Match rating. Your match rating, your highlight of the day, and that could be just having a pie. <laughs> Probably will be. Um, match rating, I, I think it's a, it was a story of two halves, personally. I think the first half was close to like a 9 out of 10, maybe, and then the second half, obviously, we dropped off. But overall, I'd give it about a 6. I'd, I'd give it about 7. I think we were, we were quite good. The second half was really disappointing and that's what docks it for me. Um, but yeah, I'd give us about a seven. I think we deserve to win. I think we did enough to win personally. But uh, And highlight of the day, I'd probably say Cooney not getting injured. That's probably, not getting injured. I love it. That's probably my highlight of the day. Just so, if, oh. if he got injured, I think Molyneux would have collapsed the amount of people that would be screaming. Is that? <laughs> I love it. We're going to do Chelsea, Jack, and then Johnny to finish with. Chelsea, uh, man of the match, performance rating, highlight of the day. Could be your Easter egg at half time. <laughs> I, um, I think one thing I'd like to say, though, uh, we've talked a lot about the VR decision, which is right, but I think we're kind of missing the point of how bad we were the second half. Yeah. Like, we're not taking responsibility for our poor performance. And it was like, it wasn't till like the 70 odd minute that we had a shot on the opposition's goal. So I think obviously VAR hurt us, but we have to take responsibility for the lack I think of. Ryan Ait Nuri coming off was uh, had absolutely. A big when Ait Nuri came off, it's kind of like our shape was confused. And maybe when the changes were coming on, it could have helped the team. But the whole of the second half, we just didn't have any control. West Ham were getting to the ball first. They were making those important decisions. And I think as much as VAR did impact at the end, we made our own problems. We were absolutely thriving in the first half and we didn't come back in the second. So I think it's important to recognise, yes, VAR upset us, but our performance should have been better. I think for the first half, I'd give it a seven because I think with our forward line, I really don't think we we're going to score a goal from open play. We had a penalty and I was happy for that, but I don't think our forwards were thriving. We had like one shot on target, so I'll give a seven. For the second half of performance, I'd give it probably a three to be kind. So probably like maybe a five overall. For my player of the match, I think I'd like to give it to Sarabia because I know we've given him a lot of flack and I think I have on the watch along. But he's took that penalty really well and he stepped up and took that responsibility. And I think my highlight of the day was that one moment when I thought we won. Well, before we got a draw and my little dog Milo came up to celebrate and it oh, was completely thought, destroyed. Yeah, no. But, you know, the dog came out and was excited. It was lovely to have him. Everyone with was him. saying in the chat, Milo's brought the look. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> BAR. And, uh, uh, everyone's saying Milo, man of the match. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jack, uh, on to you. I mean, Chelsea makes a good point. I mean, we've talked about this BAR decision, but Wolves scored two or three in the first half, like we probably should have done. It doesn't affect us, does it? No, absolutely. I mean, it, it was a game of two halves. I thought the first half was as good as we've played in a long time, to be fair. Um, just didn't get that second goal to really sort of capitalise. Um, and, and, you know, I like to credit the opposition. I thought West Ham were very good second half. Moyes changed it around tactically, went a bit more man for man, pushed Antonio right up onto the centre halves and their full backs started getting really high up the pitch and we had no answer. Eight Nori going off meant we had no out ball, and Cunha was. I think Cunha was probably trying too hard. Really, he, he was really. He was a bundle of energy, but lacked a bit of discipline and a little, little bit of you know tactical awareness of where to press and, and where not to press. And I think he was the one who lost the ball initially when we started messing about and ended up with a penalty against us. He, he gave the ball away in a really bad area, and then Doherty and Totti were kind of a bit uh, frozen on the spot, and then the cross comes in. And it's it's Kilman, so. 
masters of our own downfall to an extent, but I think we've got to give West Ham a little bit of credit for the second half performance. Um, so that said, performance rating, I'd probably go six and a half. I'd give us eight for the first half, five for the second. So kind of averages out six and a half. Um, man of the match, I'd like to give it to eight Nuri, but obviously went off quite early in the second half, didn't he? So I'm going to go Tommy Doyle. I thought he, in an unfamiliar sort of wing role, he did really well, cut inside a few times, created space. I, I do. I think he's a beautiful footballer to watch. You can tell he's come through the City Academy because he's always yeah. on the half turn and looking for that little pocket of space to play. Um, so that four million that we're going to spend in the summer is an absolute uh, steal. And highlight of the day, um, the run that Aitken Nuri made first half. Oh, when he went beat past about, about four or five. Yeah, at, yeah. You know, he scored that about, goal. Yeah, we're talking about VAR sporting. That's what we want to watch, isn't it? You know, we don't want to watch someone's toenail being given offside and stuff. We want to watch players beating people and gliding through defenders and beating tackles and, and all sorts. So, yeah, that was a, like a proper, really great moment. He got everyone up, didn't it, as well. So, yeah, I'll go with that. Fantastic. We've now got over 500 people watching live from around the world, which is fantastic. So, thanks for joining us. Johnny, to finish on, the same to you, man of the match, from your perspective, performance rating, your, your highlight of the day. And just to finish on... You know, Wolves six games out from the end of the season. You know, more points than last year. The situation in the summer, Gary O'Neill. I know we talk about VAR. What What are your expectations for the summer? Because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, concern. Will Fosen back, Gary? Will he get his new contract? What's your thoughts on that as well, just to finish this part of the show? And thank you ever so much for joining us tonight as well. No, no problem at all. Um, I think the summer will be a, quite a pivotal one, really. Um in terms of outgoings and incomings. And I think we'll, we'll get a far better uh, far better judge of where the climate lies going forward on the back of it. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the summer. Uh, how, 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 Gary O'Neill's got a three-year deal, hasn't he? Yeah. He has, yeah. But I think he's one of the lowest paid managers. I think they're right. probably giving him an improved deal, I would imagine. Yeah. 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 He's, he's, he's probably... He's been under, talking uh, about it, hasn't he, in his press conferences? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it'd be, it'd be fascinating to see what happens. If um, I just hope for quiet, well, not quieter summer, but certainly a, a, a less um, a less fraud summer than the last summer. Yes. Um, so yeah, it'd be a real pivotal time. I, I think it's too early to say what's going to happen, but it'd be interesting in in, in that sense. Um, in terms of player of the match. I mean, it's a player of the half, really, isn't it? Because the first half was good and the second half was lousy. And and O'Neill, they didn't use this interview on Sky yesterday, but when because uh, the interview lasted quite a while, they cut it off. But when I did spoke, speak to him afterwards, he was he was scathing at the two goals they conceded, giving the ball away. In a corner. He actually likened it to kids' football. He said he hadn't seen that sort of two goals conceded like that since he was involved in kids' football because they were bad goals to concede. But um, yeah, we were yeah, especially the first one as well. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they were they were pretty poor. I'd say it's hard to split Sarabia and Ike Nori, really. Um, given that Sarabia had to lead the line, I'd probably just edge him. Uh, he's, he's a hard player to... Um, I think sometimes he gets an unfair amount of flack. Right. He's, he's a very highly rated player within the club. But they, there were questions... Amongst Isn't the he the staff. most highest paid player at the club at the moment Is as well? I don't know. I don't know. Um, said that, yeah. there, there was definitely an issue that the coaches thought weren't sure whether he suited the English game before Christmas. But I think he's finding his feet a bit more technically that, you know, he's fine. And if, if he can just become more comfortable with the English game, I, th I still think there's a there's a really good player there. So I'll give it to Sarabia. Um, overall, I'd probably a six out of. 10 showing, wasn't it? You know, 8 out of 10 for the first half, 4 out of 10 for the second half. Um, the highlight, unquestionably, was the Underworld gig at Alexandra Palace that I went to in the evening, which was sensational. They are still the greatest dance band to walk the earth. Um, I think I first saw them in 1996 at the Leeds Refectory, and they were brilliant then, and they are brilliant last night. I actually went with a Wolves fan, so it's slightly Wolves-related, and bumped into another Wolves fan in the bar afterwards and had a nice chat with him. But it was an unbelievable gig. Now, well, that's absolutely fantastic. And just to remind everyone um, as well that you can get your tickets for uh, the Wolves Wembley Wonders um, at the Grand Theatre. The link is in the description below. Johnny's going to be hosting that. All the legends, apart from Alan Sunderland, who's now living in Malta, 
uh, are going to be at that. There's going to be a lot of behind the scenes footage that you're going to see that you've not seen. Lots of in-depth chat. It's at the Grand Theatre. It's already a lot of tickets have been sold as well. If you're a Wolves fan, and especially like you love all the uh, the old players and you want to hear all those old stories, you know they're all getting on a bit now. You know, you know, you don't it's, you don't know how many times you'll be able to get them all together in a room. It is at the Grand Theatre. The link is in the description below, and it also goes towards helping um, raise some money as well. Uh, for the Wolves Foundation. So make sure you do get your tickets for that. The link is in the description below. Chelsea, Liam, Jack and Johnny. Final thing, score prediction. Uh, we'll go Jack, Liam, Chelsea and Johnny. Score prediction for Forrest. 1-1. Uh, 1-1. One, one. One, one. Liam? It's gone safe. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a game we lose because I think they've got a lot more fighting them and they've got a lot more to play for than we do at the moment but we'll go with a 2-2 I think it's going to be a high scoring game we'll go 2-2 two, 2-2 two. Two, two. Charles for the sake of the watch along and needing a win I'm going to say 2-1 because I can't do another watch along in depression <laughs> I can't do it any longer so hopefully <laughs> we'll <see you> <laughs> <in the world. laughs> let's hope we do Johnny final final one for you and a final thought um, from you as well before we go yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a tough end to the season. I think the sort of the Coventry FA Cup defeat knocked a bit of the stuffing out of them. And the squad is really, really stretched at the moment. So uh, I hope they can continue to be as competitive as, as possible on the pitch. I wouldn't be surprised if it does um, dip a bit. Uh, and I wouldn't hold that against any of the coaches and management. I think they're, they're, they're really up against it. It's a tough time at the moment. I think they'll uh, I, I probably... I don't like making predictions, but if I had to, I'd say Forrest are probably going to edge it at the weekend if I had to call it. Um, but, you know, I, I remain hopeful. You never know if we get... I, I don't think Cunha was ever close to starting yesterday. And that's... I don't think... I'm not sure he'll be ready at the weekend, but who knows? Um, we, we, we'll see. But, yeah, I think I think they've done ever so well this season. I think Gary O'Neill has been hugely impressive uh, and, and brought so much to the role really seized his opportunity and I just hope that you know whatever happens between now and the end of the season if it if things are if it does become a struggle that that, that it, it's sort of not people don't hold it against him no exactly you know you know I, I, I think that you've got to be a little bit objective of where we come where, where I mean he's had three days before the start of the season got us to where we where we are you know he hasn't really had a chance to mold his team he hasn't had a pre-season he's done i mean even like even in the circumstances we talked about at the weekend with you know no out and out striker on the field the first half we were brilliant you know he come up with a plan to uh, to play really well okay we lost the game again in the end but we just need to just you know not have a meltdown because we have a not such a great end to the season because of the injuries we have got teams coming back um, and then, obviously, going the summer, summer, as you said, is going to be really, really important. Gary O'Neill's going to ha have a chance with Matt Hobbs and, obviously, Jeff to make some important decisions. And if they make the right decisions, we've got the nucleus of a very, very good side here. Um, and we could have a really good season next year if they get it right. And I think that's the, like you said, the acid test. Guys, that's the end of the first half of the show. I hope you you've enjoyed it. There is a second half to come up um, shortly um, with some more fans coming on to have their say. I uh, just want to say a big thanks to uh, to Jack. I know he's not very well. I've got a cold as well, as you can probably hear. <laughs> Struggling on. Liam, some great points. Chelsea, that win's coming the weekend. Don't worry. We're going to get that win on the watch along. And Johnny, ever so much thank you for coming on. And of course, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll talk to you a little bit closer to the event as well. Um, as a standalone special to promote that as well for you as well. So thanks for coming on tonight and giving up your time, mate, uh, and also being so honest and open with the fans. I think everyone appreciates that. Thank you. Nice to chat to everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank Cheers, you. guys. Cheers. What a great first half of the show. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, some real good, honest uh, debate. Just a reminder, again, thank you very much to uh, our friends at Creation Wolf, for powering uh, the show. We have got an absolutely fantastic second half coming up for us. Uh, I've got the producer coming over to get me another cup of tea, which is which is very much welcome. And we have got a debutant tonight as well. We've got a debutant coming on. 
But we have Lucas who's coming on first. Lucas, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you, Dave. Are you? Loving the retro top you've got tonight on, mate. Thank you. I got it for my birthday um, last week. So. Fantastic. And as we start in the second half of the show, this will go out as a, as a second half of the podcast. I do want to say thank you to Creation Wolf. Uh, the link to them is in the description uh, below. And, you know, Lucas, you're also a, a fan writer for alwayswolves.co.uk as well, aren't you? You've just recently come on board as part of the team. And if there's anyone out there that does want to write for the website as well, please get in touch with uh, with, with our socials. Uh, Lucas, how are you enjoying that so far? Yeah, I'm enjoying it. I like um, putting my point of view across um, when I'm not on extra time. So I'd like, and I like to see what um, other people think about the game um, that don't do extra time as well. Fantastic. We also have coming on tonight, who was fuming after the game, I can tell you, charismatic Craig. How you doing, mate? How you, Dave? How you doing, mate? You okay? Yes, I've seen you back in your mansion again tonight. You've been on the yeah, playing on the piano again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You've been lounging on that sofa watching the rest of the show. Yeah, yeah, you got it sleeping, bud. Now we do have to say, obviously, that uh, he has got the nickname Tuba Walls. We do call him Charismatic Craig as well, but his uh, screen name's Tuba Walls because he, he can play a tuba. He's also the musical director of two brass bands. Uh, had the chance to sh to break bread with you before the game at the weekend, mate. And you'd had a fantastic performance from one of your bands. Yeah, you yeah, were buzzing about. Really, really pleased that they were they were placed uh, fifth in a in a mixed uh, uh, category um, competition at the Birmingham Conservatoire uh, yesterday morning. Uh, played the best that they played for probably nine, ten years. Um, so I was absolutely uh, thrilled with them, Dave. They uh, they uh, they did everything and more, and uh, and really pushed uh, the championship section bands there right, right to the uh, the limit. So yeah, I was over the moon. It was a bit rushed to get to the match, but enjoyed it. Enjoyed it, which which is great, man. I'm really pleased for you because I know how much time and effort you put yeah, in, just a bit. into that. Um, we have got Mr. Cheerful Chris. Coming on, hello, mate. Mm. We call All right, him Chris. Chris because Chris, can we turn that frown upside down? Not a chance. Not, Not a chance. chance after that crap yesterday. I'm hoping <laughs> we're going to talk about the performance and what's going on with the team and Absolutely. not VAR and goals disallowed because that's the most important thing, Dave. Well, I, I, mate, it is important, but of course, VAR, the decision did have a big impact on the game, and it was. Uh, Quite rightly, that it's uh, because it's been a hot topic that we do debate and talk about that. We can't just brush over a major incident like that as much as you might not want to talk about it. Um, George is going to be a debut and he's, he's coming on here to talk Wolves. Hello, hello, hello. How are we doing? He's been wanting to come on and make a debut for a little while. We finally got him. I, I forgot again and he sent me the message. I went, Oh, yeah, I need to send you the link. George, uh, great to have you. Were you at the game yesterday? Yeah, I was. Um, enjoyed the first half and then enjoyed it 1 0 up. And then obviously, you know, West Ham, are, West Ham are a good side, aren't they? So it's, it was one of those. But then at 2 2, we had the hope. But just, yeah. Well, we'll get on to that later, I guess. But we definitely will. I'm going to start uh, with you, Craig. Uh, and then I'm going to go Lucas, Chris, and then George. Craig, um, you know what points would you like to make? What's your you you know you've had a you've had a a day to calm down. You were really ranting at the end of the game uh, when we came out. You were not happy. Um, what's your um, what what points would you like to make? Yeah, well, well the, uh, Dave in, in the first half, I thought I thought we played some great stuff. Our movement was was great. I uh, uh, went with Chris and uh, thanks for taking me again, Chris. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, we we look lively. I've, I've I made this point when our when our back three or, or back five move the ball uh, between each other at speed. We generally play with more pace. When they when they walk it between each other, we just play this awful ponderous uh, slow stuff. So I said to Chris in the first two or three minutes, I'm really pleased that the uh, we were pinging the ball about, and that showed in the first half. I thought had we had. Uh, a decent strike force. We could have been two, 
three up at half time. So, uh, so the first half performance was was really really good. Apart from the fact, that I have to say, that Doc was making some magnificent runs. Yeah, he played really well. Free. He was free so many times, and we never found him. Uh, we only found him on the odd occasion. And when we did find him, we caused the major major problems down that down that uh, left hand side. So I thought uh, that we we underused Doc in the first half, but I thought. Uh, Doc had a fantastic game. I said to Chris, I am so pleased that, that Antonio isn't playing in the first half. Because every time... We always struggle against him, don't well, we? Well, Dave, Dave, he bullies us. That's yeah. why. He bullies our, our two two middle backs. And as soon as he came on uh, yesterday, Moyes had, had clearly given them an absolute rocket. We, were, we, we weren't any slower... Uh, than, than we were in the first half. West Ham were two yards quicker and we did not adjust to that at all. They were more physical. They closed the space down. They didn't give us time to uh, to uh, play the ball around. And so they made us look really poor and we obliged. We were we were, we were were really poor in, in, in the second half. What annoys me is yet again, we gave away a stupid goal by trying to play football in our own, you know, um, red area, I, I call, where when you're under the cosh, you're not playing well, when the opposition are clearly on top of you, you start playing this 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 uh, this tippy-tappy uh, between you. And we lost it, and the penalty arose from that. And we don't learn. We don't seem to have the, 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 the intelligence or the propensity to put our foot through the ball to just clear the lines for the moment, to reset, restructure. Um, and the second half was really poor. What racks me off with VAR, and why I'm, I, I, was, I was fuming about it, is there's no consistency. So when the professionals in the game are saying they don't know what decisions the referees are going to make, and all the, uh, and all the expert uh, pundits that have played the game at the highest level don't know what the referee is going to decide because it's that inconsistent. And we saw that yesterday. Uh, that goalkeeper was in, in, getting nowhere near that. And 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 uh, Jack is absolutely right. I, I was going to bring it up, but he did it. The Man City goal, when Aki was standing on the goalkeeper, much, much worse than that yesterday. And that numpty... That gave that goal yesterday, and he is a numpty, right? Absolute poor referee. Um, he, 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 oh, the decisions, Dave, to, 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 to uh, just just summarise, are so inconsistent. Nobody knows where they are. And to shout out to Chris in the first thirty seconds of the game yesterday, he said, "By the way, Craigie, this ref's crap." He said, we, we are going to have a nightmare uh, with this referee. We were the masters of our own um, uh, downfall again um, yesterday. Gary can be as, as upset as he likes. I love the passion at the end. I just wish he'd have thumped him. I just wish Gary would have just thumped, thumped the ref. Because <laughs> I, that could I, make a TikTok on its own. Oh, look, look. The stadium wanted it. I did. I wanted him to go and, and, and like, you know, Knuckle him, but unfortunately, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're more, I suppose, reserved. Um, but well, we, we can't really condone that, really. You don't it's, really I, I don't care. You, you, you can, you can't, I can, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it, Dave, it's inconsistent, and that's the problem. Nobody knows where they stand with it anymore. That's, well said. That's my well said. Take. Luke, Lucas, uh, your thoughts coming back on that, and also contribute your the points that you'd like to make and guys just to let you know um you can join in the conversation all you need to do is subscribe to the channel for literally one second uh supports us um and you can also join in the uh the conversation in the chat we will put some of the uh, comments there's over five but nearly 550 of you watching live um any super chats will guarantee to be going on the uh on the uh, the screen as well they obviously do support us as well so, and uh, so yeah, and if you see anyone with a little little wolf, coloured wolf in the chat, they're members. 
um, which means they support the channel and are, are part of the Discord group as well. So, like, if you want to be a member, the links to that as well. Lucas, I know you've been itching to uh, to have your say. Let it all out, mate. Let let us feel feel what you want to say. Um, as I'm a ball boy, there's been a new rule put in place that uh, ball boys cannot pick up the ball off the cone. That's just due to the players. So I think yesterday the ball went out of play. Um, and then for those who don't know, you you actually are a ball boy at Wolves, aren't you? At the moment, yes. so you are part of the ball boy team. Yeah. Um, so the ball's gone out, and then um, it's gone in David Moyes' technical area, and it's Wolves throwing. Walls have gone quick and David Moyes has chucked the ball onto the pitch. Yeah. So that should have been a sending off for a uh, delaying opposition restart. So he shouldn't have even been on the touchline for the second half or first. Um, I think we're just missing somebody that just gets the ball and drives. Uh, I know yesterday, Aitnori did it a bit and Tommy, but we just need somebody else because Tommy needs to be getting more um, forward and Aitnori is staying forward as well. If you look at the formation we played yesterday, Aitnori is in the midfield. And um, we just need somebody to help Aiden Nora because he can't always go across the pitch to always get there as well. I think Ryan had one of the best games in ages I've seen him play. And that's definitely something really because how big he's been part of all the season. And it's just been exceptional for him. The Wolves messy, uh, Ryan Aiden Nora. He's got so, I mean, he's got so much skills in him, mate. He's really talented. To say um, he didn't get much game time under Lopetegui, and now he's come with Gary, and he's been one of our best players this season. Why do you think he got no game time under Lopetegui? Because he was a bit bombed out, and obviously he's had a fresh lease of life this year. He's looked like you know a world class player. Um, why do you think that was? I just don't think Lopetegui liked his attitude because I remember um, I think it was when Eight Nori shaved his hair off. Um, and he put him on training on his own. So I think Lopetegui had his favourite players, and if he didn't like the attitude of one of the players, he just put them on their own. And there we see the benefits this year, and he seems to be flourishing, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, fearful, over to you. Uh, well, 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 just just on, on Lopetegui. So Lopetegui didn't trust Ryan A. Nori the same way I don't trust him as a pullback babe. And he's he's where he's playing now, where he hasn't got that defensive responsibility. He's revelation because he, he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to track back, although he does at times. And that's why we're seeing the best of him now because he, he's those shackles are off him. Um, and and Lobatecki, he, 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 that those kind of elite managers are, are all about not conceding and doing doing what you've got to do. You think about the the uh, Seville team that. that did so well in Europe. That's that's what they were so hard to beat, and that's how the the base that they built it on. So that that's what we're going on there. Um, I, I've got a bit of a different view to everybody else. I thought it was a goal. I thought um, that it's not a VAR issue. This is this is the rules, and this is this is the problem. Is, is that the rules have changed and allowed this to happen? But yes, I think it's wrong, and and and, and going back to how yeah, I like, I thought, all I'm going to say is the same referee allowed the same goal when he was on VAR, the the, the Man City goal, exactly yeah, that, that, the same goal. So why is the same referee judging? Why is the same referee disallowing exactly the same goal that? He lets a goal go exactly the same incident for Manchester City. Why is he, that? Is he talking well, about the rules and consistency? Why is there no consistency? Well, because this referee in particular is an arse, Dave. And this is yeah, but like he might be an arse, but why isn't he being an arse to Man City? Why is because he being he's an arse to be, Dave? Because he's not fit for doing the job. I mean, you said to Craig in the first 30, 30 seconds you, that this referee. I didn't referee know who the ref was, and I saw him run out and I said to Craig straight ahead. Shit, we've had it here. It's Tony Harrington. He's fucking useless. That's what I said. That that was my exact words. You know, and I've watched him referee other games, and and it, 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 he's he's awful. He's awful. So I get why I get why he's upset. But the rules are the rules. It's a goal. And and it isn't that is it? It isn't. Yeah, it is, it is no, it is. But Chris, it, it really is not. It's not the rules are the rules are a goal. It's. It, it's subjective. Dave, is it a goal? Yeah, it's not a rule because an offside rule is you're, you're one foot offside and you're not offside. Is, is he interfering? Is the keeper going to get it? Everyone with common sense can see that that 
is a goal. I'm not having it, Chris. I'm sorry. You can obviously you, you've got you you disagree, but like every single person can see that that's a, that it's a goal. It's a goal. They, the keeper's not getting to it. I, I I completely agree. He's not getting to it, but he's in an offside position. He's put himself put himself in a position to but the allow goal the referee he was holding him back just, anyway. Well, before that, he stood too why, Anto- why is the goal for the corner given? When Antonio's backing into Saar in an offside position, because but no, Dave, he's not offside because the ball's from a corner. You can't be, can't but be the offside. Ball's from a, the ball's from a corner. Nobody's the touched the ball. Offside. Nobody's touched the ball apart from Paul Prowse. It's gone straight in from and the corner. He's obstructing the keeper. Oh well, he's obstructing the keeper, but he's not offside. But it's still, it's still a it's foul, close, isn't it? It's a mm. foul. It, you've you, you just said it's offside, and it's not. I'm just trying to make the point. Okay. That you've got to have the rules correct, and you've got to. Do, you you isn't can't it say it's so though, isn't yes, it? Yes, it was exactly the same kind of thing, and because on t- Antonio is a bigger, stronger fellow, he pushed Tar out of the way. Chris, and it was you know. Can I come in there? Is it the rules are surely if he's interfering with play, and he's and he what is he five foot ten? Our boy Fabianski is six foot three. The ball's come down from seven foot. He's seen that ball every step of the way. He just ain't getting to it, Chris. No, no, I, no goalkeeper I, on the planet will stop that. I so he can't agree be that that's in what the rules allow. He this can't be interfering with play, though. Chris, Chris it is, it's not a rule, is it? It's subjective. That is why the VAR didn't go offside. And they sent the referee to Absolutely. look at the monitor because it was subjective. And they showed him a slow motion still. And he, because he'd been sent to the monitor, he hadn't got the balls to stick with his decision. And had he done that, everyone, no one would have said anything. Yeah. He would have gone on match of the day. Gary Lineker, all the rest would have gone, well done, son, sure. for actually sure. sticking with your decision. But he was, he bottled it. He bottled it yeah. and he gave it to the thing. And they just, it, it was subjective. It offside, be- offside. How many times do you see an offside decision where the, the ref goes to the monitor? You never do. But when it's a Wolves game, he goes and he comes out. The second he goes... No, nah, Dave, goes. Dave, he's not going to Wolves games and looking at the off- monitor just because it's Wolves and offside. No, this conspiracy stuff. Monitor. This conspiracy stuff's a load of crap. You know, it's not... It, I'm this not going on about conspiracy. I'm on about it's not offside. It's not offside when it's a do you think? Do you, do you think their goal should have been disallowed? But on the No, on, I no. don't... No, 100% don't... It, you know, Sunday League football, League Two, League One, Championship, you know, parks, pitches, thingy, school. Everyone, you know, I used to do as a number 10 when I play, I used to love sitting on the keeper just in front of him, you know, to stop him. Well, but that's what I used to do. All the time. Well. We've all done it. It's it's football. You can't take that sort of thing away from the game. So no, the Dave, first, the Dave first... I'm on about Tomato, the foul on Tomato. Do you think that was a foul? Yes, because he, no. he literally, yeah. Dave, he, when I played football, I was told to make that right. If he doesn't blow in the net, yeah, same time. yeah. Hold on, hold on. He's not jumped up and headed it and like gone, you know, gone up and headed it over the top and gone over the top. He's caught his foot and he's gone down. If that's a penalty in the penalty area, it's a penalty at the other end. It's a penalty. If that's anywhere else on the pitch, it's a foul. With you know. It, it's a definite foul. VAR reviewed that as well. He's clipped him and he's gone down, so it's a foul. Dave, uh, Dave, in the comments, you've got a lot of people saying that you can't be offside from a corner. That wasn't the reason that they the, the asked him to check. That ball was played in. Then Kilman headed the ball. So so then, uh, offside that's what it comes, comes into play. play. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The issue is, was he interfering with play? play I don't wasn't. believe... I don't believe that he was because no oh, goalkeeper on that planet is saving that header. So, Lucas, so how can he be? So, how can he, so, so did did the Wolves player change the results of Kilman's header? No, because no, no no goalkeeper would have saved it. So he wasn't interfering with play. That's my argument. Lucas, was he interfering with play? Was that the keeper? Would, would the keeper was it, should that goal have been disallowed? But the Wolves one. Yeah. It's. In my opinion, I had the perfect view of it in the stadium. I was in line with Fabianski. The ball's got crossed in it. And I'd, um, Fabianski went to one side. He's looked at our player and he's run back behind Fabi- uh, our player. 
So it should have stood because he's gone back from um, behind him. So he had. Yeah, okay. he, you see, if you look at Keith Hackett on um, Twitter, he's um, he's the only referee I listen to, and he he Keith Hackett basically said that um, Fabianski shouldn't have moved and shouldn't have, shouldn't have had Chura in the way so that he would have been outside the ball, and therefore he thought it should have been a goal. But he says the problem is is the rule, and it doesn't give that it doesn't give them the the clarity enough to not do it. And what you've got, you've got a situation there where the referee can give that that he gave because the rules allow him to. And that's what I'm saying. This is the problem with the rules. It needs to be more specific. Exactly. And it needs to be fixed. George, you've waited really, really patiently. A passionate debate here tonight. We love, we love debate. It's great to get it, you know, all the debate and stuff and talk about it. We're passionate fans. It winds me up, the, this VAR stuff. I don't think there's a conspiracy. I think Johnny Johnny said there might be a subliminal bias. I think probably that's whereabouts it is. What's your take? Well, oh, first thing I'll say is... What do you want to make about the game as well? Then let's not just get... Yeah, yeah, no, let's not keep it VAR, VAR because we can, we can ramble on about VAR all we want, but realistically, nothing's going to change. As much as I'd love to scrap it, because I think that would be the best thing to do, Probably not going to happen, is it? Unless people riot. But let's be honest. I love, I love watching the babbies. We all love watching the babbies. We're not going to give that up for a protest. But anyway, um, in my opinion, I think judging by the state of the game and the sort of minute, the minute the goal goes in, as it's the last minute equaliser, there's no way that should be interfered with. I just feel like sometimes the refs have got to judge it as if it's that close and it's at that point of the game and it's an e like an equaliser right at the last minute, you can't take that away from the fans. And especially when it's such such margin marginally as well. If it's in the 70th minute, fair enough. But when it's that marginal, I don't know, I don't it just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It's it's frustrating, isn't it? You know, in regards to in regards to that, I mean, how are you feeling after the game? I think, to be honest, it, even though we could have got a two-two out of it, I think West to to come away with a loss, a narrow loss. West Ham, they're a best, they're a better team than us. They've been heavily backed. We haven't been backed. You know, you you compare player for player. If you're going combined eleven. They're much stronger than us. So I think we should be proud. I'm not trying to be like a preach here and be like ultra positive, but we should be proud of the way we set up first half. And let's face it, Moore's given them a hairdryer. Second half, they come out and they absolutely destroyed us. And even though their goals are fortunate off a penalty and off a corner, let's be honest here, the Emerson goal probably shouldn't have been disallowed either. So there's that to talk about as well. Um, well, Billy Bob's a West Ham fan here. Yeah, I was just, I was just about to say it. I was just about to say that if West Ham fans, them because we know what rival fans are like when a decision goes their way. You know, we've had it before the Neto penalty against Man U. At the, at the time, we were probably quite thankful for it. We are like, well, we deserve it. That wasn't a penalty, no way, but you take it, don't you? And you usually don't really admit to it. West Ham fans have been, you know, West Ham fans have literally been saying, unlucky Wolves, can't believe that's happened to you again. So, I don't... As I said, I always look at the Emerson goal as well. Should that have been disallowed? Not sure. Well, that, well, that was the kind of the point that Chris was making just about like, I mean, to me, it's a foul because he has clipped him and he's gone down. And if it's the other way around in the penalty area, that's given us a penalty, so it's a foul. Mm, and it's anywhere, like, on the, like, anywhere else on the pitch, it's a foul. Craig and Lucas, what's your thoughts on that incident? Yeah, it was really, really close. Uh, we... we uh, we were very fortunate uh, to uh, to get away with that. Can I can I throw something else in for the guys to talk about as well? Because me and Chris uh, both agreed on this. I thought Gon waited far too long to use substitutions. Lamina's yeah, legs, the Lamina's legs had gone, Dawes' legs had gone, and uh, and they were running over us for 10, 15 minutes before uh, before he made any move. But there isn't really uh, anyone to bring on. That's the problem. Absolutely, George. And uh, and the problem with Lamina is I uh, I think that he's he's been overplayed because mm -hmm. his game is all about energy, isn't he? And running yeah. box to box. And I think he's shot. Doyle's only got 60, 65 minutes in him. 
So we needed to make those two uh, substitutions. And Tororo, when he came on, I thought he was excellent. He was yeah. aggressive. He was putting his foot in. And the game changed, changed again because we had somebody fresh in there that, that was competing. Lamina and, and Doyle just stopped competing after half time because they were knackered. I think so Doyle's was... game, Doyle reminds me a bit of Nevers. So if Doyle's having to play number one out of position and number two covering ground they wouldn't usually cover, you are going to see him suffer, aren't you? He's, he's like a Nevers. He should be sat in front of the defence, pinging balls. But he, he's not allowed to do that. He's playing left wing yesterday, you know what I mean? Uh, Patrick Moran says Craig is bang on. It, it, it's a, it's a it's a it's a problem that we we seem to have. Um, we're not we're not introducing the subs when we're getting tired. We we we. I don't know whether he hasn't got the confidence in him. He, he's trying to stick with with the players that he trusts. Maybe he doesn't want to take Lamina off. He's playing Lamina up front at stages in games, and he's he's. He's, you know, his his tank's empty, and and you know, Traore can come straight on for Lamina, and he could have done that after fifty five minutes when West Ham made their changes, seeing what they were doing, and thought we're going to get over on. I knew that we we'd outwork West Ham's midfield the first half. I said to Craig at the start of the game, "We'll win this with midfield in in this." And as soon as he made those changes, um, Moyes did. He did a tactical number on him. That really, I think that's that's what what happened. But, but you know, this this is this is why I'm getting a bit worked up about the way we're playing the last five games, the subs. You know, we're playing people out of position in, you know, up but front. We're playing fullbacks. We had five fullbacks on the bloody pitch at one point, and it, it, you know, get you've got these kids on the bench, so you deem that they you that they're worth playing and and can can do a job. So give them the time, get them on the pitch and 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 play them and 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 as the the one that really is really going to irritate me is is Nua Lamina and no, I, don't Lamina, why, yeah. I don't know why he's not coming on the pitch. If he's not ready, then he shouldn't be on the bench. If he if he's if he's the only one we've got, he can't be. Let's get one of the other under twenty ones that because he's made the choice that these other kids he's bringing in from the twenty ones are are okay to be on the bench. So get somebody from the bench. I just can't. He's got pay. We're, we're struggling for pace, and Tommy Doyle, Tommy Doyle's a midfielder. He's running around like a lunatic on the wing, and we, we, oh, we don't no. bring him on. It's his position. It's just mad. In fairness, Chris, though, if we only see ten percent of what happens, if Gary O'Neill's decided he's not good enough, and there's literally no one else to put on the bench, if he's not even going to give him any time to come into the team. You don't know if he was brought in just to support Lamina with obviously what happened to their dad. So I don't know. He's literally only played a, what is it? Is it a half? He's half. He's played a half. He's played for the under twenty ones tomorrow night. I think he'll yeah. be We are joined. I am so pleased we haven't had him on in a live for ages. Um, Wolf and Jeff, <laughs> where about whereabouts in the world are you, Jeff? Uh, and I'm back in Chattanooga. I've been in Nashville uh, or Nash Vegas this weekend with about 30,000 Premier League fans. And we had a really strong showing of Wolf supporters throughout the U.S. And so I do want to explain, if it looked like we were having a little too much fun, it wasn't because we were happy with the result. It's just the fact that some of us got together about a 1,000 miles apart from each other and uh, enjoyed each other's company and shared each other's misery. <laughs> so we it's just spoiled yeah. yeah. our own time. But it was uh, it was a heartbreak, um, and I, I do agree with some of the comments here that I I don't think we deserved to win. But when we almost got it, or, or or at least came back with the draw, that that really hurt a lot. I think anytime you, of course, you know, we started with the penalty, and it looked like we were in the driver's seat. So every time it, you know, every time a, a win turns into a draw, and every time a draw turns into a loss, that hurts even more. But yeah, and the VAR decision just c compounds on that. It's, it's, I, d I don't know if it's the frustration is so much with this decision. It's the fact what it's the tenth or eleventh this year. Uh, that's that's what is just kills you, and it really makes you. So if it was just this today, I don't think we would be nearly as upset. But it's it's the compoundment of it. 
It's the yeah over the last. I just made up a word compoundment, and so Tuba, you you can word. use that at school this week. So. It's a good word, Lucas. Uh, you obviously you've listened to uh, George, uh, what he's had to say. What what else have you spotted from the game that you'd like to bring up? And then we're going to go to Chris because I know, I think he's got a few more things that he wants to bring up as well. Well, I was sharing with uh, some other friends this weekend. I mean, right now, and I think Gary's doing. I think fantastic with what he's given, but we're we're such a, a weak inside right now. We're held together by duct tape and birthday wishes, and it's um, so that's kind of adding on to it. There is the hope that some of our other players may be coming back, but I think what you guys were talking about, we don't we don't see how they are on the field in, in between matches. Yes, we see that Huang may be back soon. We saw that Dawson was available, but we didn't see how Dawson looked this week. And we didn't see how Cunha, even though he was able to come in, you know, when you saw him on the team sheet, you're thinking, well, you know, he's back, you know, in there. So he's got he's got that combination of trying to not have the situation go worse by having more injuries. Uh, um, so it's, it's, it's very frustrating. And the, I think the big part is we've got so many injuries up front, out in that one area. And yes, we're already a small side, and that is a problem. There's no question there. But any club, when you have that many of your forward players out, it's going to impact you. Uh, so yes, we obviously have to get more in those areas. But I, I think any any club that was well stacked, you get that many players out. Um, it's it's really gonna it's gonna cause some problems. And so I. I was frustrated with – I wasn't as frustrated with, with seeing Ryan Antonuri come out, even though that probably had the biggest impact because he was an impactful player. But the other substitutions, Dave, I felt was a little bewildered by. So why were these other players who were contributing and be a part of it being brought in with, to me, seems like uh, the B team. And if we were up 2-0, then I would understand it. Or maybe even if we were down nil two, I might understand it. But we were still in the match, and I understand if Ryan Ernery needed to come out, Cunha is a good option. But the other subs, I, I had to scratch my head over. Uh, I'm sure Chris has got something to say about that. Lucas, um, first, if you want to come back on that and make your points, and then to Chris. Give no Lamina a chance because he in the training video he looks good, but training is a different scenario to the games. But if we give him a chance to see what he's made of, he could try and help with squad depth, start one game maybe, just give a player a rest. But we still got Enzo Goncalves uh, coming back from injury, so I think we should also give him a chance in the first team because I remember. I think is that was... the young lad that we bought in that went away with the Chile national, the Chile team to qualify for the Olympics? Yeah, yeah. Paraguayan, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Paraguay, I do apologise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I, I think it was PSV that played um, in the under-21s and he just looked fantastic, but it's also a different scenario to first-team football. But we need to give if we could give them both a chance and help us just rest some players, it would probably help us push on for the rest of the season. Chris? Uh, going back to the subs, so the reason that these, these players are coming on is that our first-team 13 or 14, whatever the number is, are just knackered. They're, 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 they're done. They're, they're, the season is over. They've played too much. They've been overworked because the squad is small. And and this goes back to what my next point is. It was very nice to hear from Mr. She uh, today, telling me all about the uh, wonders of football and what he goes there for. And, and you know, I haven't heard from Mr. She all season. And, um, you know, I certainly didn't hear from him in January when the squad needed boosting and it didn't get boosted. And um, it's on his watch, unfortunately, that we're now having to make do with uh, a ragtag bunch of Chris, can players. I come back on you there? So you think it's a good idea to spend £4 million loaning Brozier who we have absolutely got to play, which is what uh, you get more... Dave, of, keep on about this, Brozier. I'm not talking Brogia, about Brozier, mate. He was brought up at the press conference. Yeah, but I'm, was... not on, I'm not on about Brozier. I'm on about 
championship strikers, championship wingers, ones that win Anyone? a club, at no money, that, that very little money that would have boosted our squad that was not big enough. What, cha what, champion, is... what championship striker or winger are you on about then? Any players at the lower level would have come into a premiership team and would have been able to give you... Are they going to be any better watch, than our academy? You just watch fucking commentary yes. stuff us in, in a cup match. And, and, and our commentary players. going to let their main striker go in January when they're trying to get promotion? I'm not... Or the likes they, of Southampton or people it, like that. It could be any any club. A, a, a season pro, 26-27, that's been playing in the Championship that can do 20 minutes of a match is better than what we've got now. And they could have got that for very little money in January and boosted our squad. Our squad does not have a depth. And that was a, a decision made by the, the powers that be that we were going to do it. And, and O'Neill has said that now. He said that in the, in the, in the thing. And he, I don't think a Broja thing is a thing. I think it's a, a, a smoke screen. It could have been any player that he was after. We didn't We didn't back him. And this is why we're in this position. I don't think we're going to win another game this season. Oh, come well, on. OK, I mean, yeah, I mean, I get it, Chris. I mean, we all know for ages we need a brand new number nine. Tell, tell me which game we're, we're going to win now. Number nine. The mistakes that have been made by Poson and Jeff are not mistakes that have been made this season. They are historical mistakes. Spending 35 million on Fabio Silva, spending 30, 40 million on, on, on Geddes. Players with Mendes pushed to us that we had under Bruno Large, who, by the way, was given £100 million to spend. Julian Lopetegui was given like £80 million last January. You know, unfortunately, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, mistakes have been made. And I think kind of Jeff put his hand up today. And I'm not trying to say, I'm not one way or the other. I'm kind of keeping my powder dry for seeing what happens this summer. But like any owners that want to go and break the rules when you've got a risk of a points deduction is incompetent. That's I'm not talking incompetent. about breaking the rules. He's had, well, he had, it is because he's, he's got head over. He we had, had, to pay off. We had to pay off Johnny Otto. Johnny Otto's he didn't have to pay off Johnny off. Otto. He could have kept him at the club and paid his wages. He, was he wouldn't have had to pay anything off. Yeah, but he needed like... to go. He needed to go. He could have sat at home then, couldn't he? He could I've have told him to leave. stay at home, keep away, yeah, we'll pay you. Leave. And what's yeah, going to happen then when you've got a player that we're paying wages to not, to not play? Well, well, we paid more than that to get rid of him. Chris, it's ifs and buts, mate. Yeah, we could have maybe got some mid-table championship striker that could have come and sat on the bench. No, uh, can I, he would have can come I... on and done absolutely nothing. And we'd have gone, why have we bought him? He's a load of crap. We I've done it, I did it, I did something about like Chai Adams recently about Wolves being linked to Channels, and half the Wolves fans are going, We don't want him. This is kind of someone that we can get on a free transfer that's 26 27, that's played four seasons in the in the Premier League, that's got assists and goals in the championship this year, and we can get on a free and people saying, Oh, we don't want him. And it's like, why wouldn't we want someone like Chai Adams, who I think would be a squad player to come in and we, I think we'll invest in another striker as well. It's like ifs and buts. We could have, we might have, this, that, the other. I mean, like Jeff has said, what's the odds of eighty percent of your strike force in one area of the pitch being out? If you do, if you take that out of Manchester City's front line, they have got a deeper squad because they've got much more to spend. But it's going to affect them. We've seen what's happened with Liverpool when they've had players out. You take four out of five forwards out your lineup, any team is going to have problems. Oh, you, you, you're right. They will have problems, but what I'm saying is, is that we we put ourselves in a position, and we, we, we this is our lot. We've got to deal with it, you know. And we we've got to we've got to play with this team now. At the end of the season, there's no other players coming in. There, there isn't no, and I, I think Johnny Johnny Phillips has said as well. Look. We have got to be realistic as Wolves fans. I mean, I'm, this is just my opinion, you know, give me my opinion now. I'm frustrated that we haven't solved the number nine problem since Raul, you know, the issues. I've, I'm frustrated at the money that's been wasted in the past, which has caused the mess that we've had to deal with to get out the FFP issue. And believe me, you, me, there are other teams that are going to be dealing with this FFP um, 
storm next season. Newcastle, all the money in the world. They can't spend the money. Villa are going to have issues with it as well next year. You know, there's lots of other teams. Wolves are coming out the other end. And they've had to be careful. We've still and got to be careful, Dave. We're we do. But, but for a full fact, Wolves have budgeted to finish 17th this year. And they would have, with the 17th, they budgeted to have around about 2.3 million clear water if we finish 17th. If we mm. finish 17th. We've had the Johnny Otto thing to go out on, to, on top of that as well. And that's because the accounts for this year will go in to the, to the Premier League in January and... Our, our accounts actually don't work like a lot of other Premier League accounts. A lot of other Premier League accounts work till the end of June. So there's a little bit of trading in regards to like the, the window opens in the in the in the middle of June. So Wolves end at the end of May. And that's because they want all their trading business to go into one financial year, not have an overlap. So obviously we are going to finish a lot higher than 17. So we could finish as high as I don't think we'll make the top eight now. I think we could finish as I have maybe nine. Well, I did a table calculator. So you put all the results in. Yeah. Where you think, however it'll do, and it puts it in a table, and we come 10th. So if we go off my knowledge, we'll finish 10th. Say we did come 10th. It's about £2 million a place. So above seventh, a seventh, that's about another £15 million on top of yeah. the £2 million. So it gives us around about that sort of 15 to £20 million that we're going to have leeway plus what we bring in on player sales now fabio silva might go we might sell Geddes. there'll be probably some other players so that might bring in another i mean fabio silva 10 15 million is all we can realistically get for him if we're lucky Geddes, obviously we'll get a bit of money um and then obviously there's a big one that gets sold a kilman a netto an eight nori uh a joe well, gone. Gone well, the bid. Gone. But say you get sort of 40, 50, 60 million, that will, and, and they give sort of 80% of that to Gary in the summer. We could be ending up with around about 60, 70, 80 million to spend in the summer. And I think this is where, where we have to be patient and we have to really, 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 as fans, hold our nerves and not have a meltdown and wait to see what happens with the summer. Because believe you me, this summer, if they make mistakes and they don't do a good job, I'm going to be in that camp as well, going, what the hell's going on? But I am waiting to see, because I do believe that they've learnt the lessons. We've got Matt Hobbs, who's done a good job. I think Jeff Shee's taken a bit of a, a step back from it. And he's he's kind of in his statement today saying he's putting his hand up. I think it's kind of a little bit of an admission. There's been mistakes that have been made there. Gary O'Neill clearly, to me, has got a bond with the players. The players clearly love him. I know people are going, oh, you might go to West Ham. Why would he go to West Ham? Because, well, he, again, I'll say he'll just end up in a manager that just goes from one club to the other. He wants some stability for himself as well. I think they'll back him. And I think we'll see what happens in the summer. I mean, look, George, Craig, where are you with that? What, what, what you, what you I'll let Craig go first because I've spoke a bit. So yeah, On the Neto front, uh, uh, I sent to Chris uh, yesterday. What right-minded football club is going to spend a fortune on Neto? He has not completed one season for us yet. He's injury prone, unfortunately. He is, though, and that's a fact. So, so if we're going to generate huge money, it's going to be selling somebody we don't want to sell. Um, Craig, can I just come in on this? Yeah, of course. Just one second. And the... Football, I was no one lying. Gone would 100% go to West Ham if they did call. Absolutely no agree. chance Absolutely. at all. I don't know where Absolutely. you even get it from. There's no way. Why would he go to West Ham? You know, they, they, they hate the manager that they've got at the moment that's got them a European trophy into the quarterfinals of the European Cup and, the, and like, eighth in the Premier League. You know, he's loved by the Wolves fans. He... He he needs stability for him to build his career. He needs two or three years in the same place. He's a young manager. He ain't right. going to jump to go to West Ham. They're like only there were only right. six points clear of us. Dave, Dave, he was massively stung, and rightly so when Bournemouth sacked him. He'd 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 done a fantastic job with him. They were down when he when he took over as manager. Yeah. Bournemouth were dead and buried, and he and he and he got them up to safety. And they thanked him by by sacking him. Guns going nowhere. He, he he'll be with us for for four or five years. I I think 
because he, he's got a project as well. He's a, he's a very, you, very... And as a, a manager, as a manager. young manager, someone's saying, oh, they've got Europe. So what? They've got yeah, Europe. Nice what? So true. what? He's going to end up going. He, he took over Bournemouth with no notice at all. Had to Obviously, he was working there. He stepped up, kept him up. He's coming to Wolves for three days before the start of the season, not knowing the players, and built a thing. And he's going to go into West Ham and start all over again. Why would Mike. he do that? Makes no sense. He's yeah, not going to happen. So don't worry about that. It's not going to West Ham. Calm down, Dave. You've got a cold. I have got a cold. Yeah, I'm, just like, I'm just like... I know like, you are. I'm sort of not seeing you this uh, irritated for a long time. Um, <laughs> anyway, look, look, Dave. I, my concern is actually not with the forwards. You know it isn't. He's on a three-year contract, Paul, already. <laughs> yeah. He's on a three-year contract. He'll get Dave, a new contract. Dave, calm down. Calm down. Calm down, it's only commercial. You don't want to let the ref uh, uh, get get thumped, but you, you, you're trying to uh, thump all your members. <laughs> so, I'm calm just down. not going <laughs> anywhere. Um, my, I, I, I said uh, again uh, yesterday, my my worry is in our centre backs. We we when our forwards are fit, we were scoring goals for fun, but we we're conceding stupid goals. Really basic, stupid goals. So for me, I would want to buy two two quality centre halves. You know that, real classy centre halves. Yeah. So because Samedo's playing out of his skin, uh, we've got enough cover on the uh, on the left hand hand side with two or three players that can play there. But our centre back pairing worries me incredibly. Kilman's now captain. I'm sorry, he isn't, and and he's got so many mistakes in him. Uh, all this. Doddering about. Man United uh, uh, apparently won him. Well, you can you have him. What? I'd sell you know him. He's great, I'd Man United. Him. Take I'd, him. I'd absolutely sell him tomorrow. It's another Maguire. 80 million quid, you can have him. Um, 80 million. But, but, you know, I mean, I mean, um, uh, Jeff, who, who I watch on, on the international uh, podcast, always, always find your interest in Jeff. So nice to talk to you. Um, on my porch. On my porch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, um, yeah, the sound would be bad if I was on the porch. But one thing <laughs> I want to comment about what you what you said about the center backs, Craig. Yeah. Uh, when we looked at uh, West Ham today, that was an example how they were able to play so compact. Yeah. And 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 to close us down. Now, recently, our play has been much more strong by pushing up in the middle, and they knew it. And they were able to close that down, and we're not able to do that on the other side. So I 100% agree. That's probably, I mean, yes, we still obviously we got open areas. We we got to get wingers in. Uh, we got to get at least a winger right now. But if we tightened up this summer over in center backs, I love Kilman. I, I'd like to keep Kilman, but I don't know if he is the captain. I don't think he's got the fight that he is the rallying of the troop. I think he's a little too passive. Um, so having someone else maybe be captain and to, to see that improvement, I a hundred percent agree Cunha. with what you said there, man. Cunha should be captain, build the team around him. Who's that? Cunha. I, be, I think Cunha is our best all around player. And I think he brings a lot to the team. Like with, when he came into the dressing room, it all changed. I think that like locks, January transfer window was so underrated for the players he brought in. You know, you look at the six players he brought in, five of them are key players in the first team now. I think Cunha, he's come into the dressing room and he's, he's trying, he's, he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's, he's a bit daft, but he, he tries his absolute best. You see him running back, getting the ball, defending. I've never, to be honest, I've never, I used to love Neves like, so much, but Cunha is my, one of my new favourite players like, and he's, beginning to overtake Neves, even though he's only just been here a year. And I think, given the armband, build the team around him, because if you can keep him, you got a star on your hands. Lucas, I want you to come in on this one. Um, Kilman, your thoughts, uh, the captaincy. You probably see um, things a little bit closer than some of us as well, being that, like, obviously the ball boy and stuff like that. You see probably a little bit behind the scenes stuff, what goes on. What's your, uh, what's your take? Well, I'm just... Try to do my best maths as possible, but we sell Kilman for 30 to, uh, 35 to 40 million, and then if anyone bid comes in for Neto, 60 to 80 million, um, we've got 90 to 105 million to go buy some big players. 
So then the some big profits that we could buy some we could buy a cent we can replace Kilman, we could find a replacement for Neto, find a number nine with all that money. So if we just sell them to we can try and build a squad. And that's without other players going as well. Like uh, Fabio Silva and Guedes. So if Fabio Mascara as well. Mascara. I would like to see Mascara come back to be honest, because he's uh, I think he's got potential. Oh, 100 percent but do you not think he's too similar to Tato? Dunno. I mean, he Chris, plays right side. Chris, you're nodding, nodding, aren't you? There is he right sided? Yeah, he plays right sided. My square. Um, I'd like to see for the rest of the season. Um, if Dawson's coming back, I'd like to see Bueno alongside Dawson for a while. Um, mm-hmm. I think, I think, I think Max is not a captain. I think he's been a shadow of the player he was when he had Connor Cody alongside him. Yeah, he 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 looks lost. Me and Craig, I, I pointed out to Craig there was a free kick that Wolf yeah. Rose was taking, the one that he sailed just over the bar, and Max hadn't got a clue what to do. He was turning around looking at Sar. He wasn't in the wall. He didn't get across to the wall. Sar told him to get in the wall. He then stood with his back to Sar, and he was the one that should have been controlling the wall. And Sar shouted at him. He turned around and. And it was like, Christ, he's having to tell you everything to do and you're supposed to be the captain. You know, the captain in that back four, back five needs to, you know, run it. He needs to run it, let alone the rest of the pitch. And I just don't think he commands it well enough. Uh, he, he, he's been a great, great buyer. Lovely for us. lad. And he, say again? He's a lovely lad. Yeah, and he's been a great buyer for us and he, and he does... He, I think Kilburn's too well. nice. Do you think he's too think nice? He's, to I don't think he's it. too nice. I don't because he can he can give one out when he needs to. But he, 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 I just don't think he's commanding enough. He needs to be. You always have you you always have a, a set. You're right. You go. You're you're the guy that's going to get the ball and and you'll go meet the ball and I'll clear up after you. He's a clear up after your centre half. He's the guy who look where the ball might go and run and clear it up and lay it off. He's not the. He's not the, the intercept to get the ball. Uh, bueno does that. He was doing it well. And and if you notice, Bueno um, ha, um, Bueno handed handed um, Antonio over, took him over off uh, um, Kilman yesterday because it killed, he was destroying Kilman. And uh, Bueno Bueno did a much better job in handling. Kilman, to be yeah. fair, has struggled to go down against Antonio every time he's played against this. I mean, I'd love Antonio down at. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'd love I'd love Antonio. Dave, every yeah. quality every quality defender that is defending their box with a winger coming in, where do they keep their arms? Where are their arms? Well, you're supposed to be behind your side. Now, always behind the back. They yeah, behind the back. Yeah. I'm an American. I even know that. Exactly. <laughs> oh, behind, behind the backs. What was his arms do, doing? Uh, doing out? And and those and and, and people say, "Oh, great, that's they're really really critical." It isn't. It's part of your art. If if you're a, if if you are a professional defender, that has got to be a part of your makeup, surely. Well, so yeah, they do train that. But your natural thing is when you're stretching out your leg, which is what he's probably trying to do to stop it. You balance with your arm, don't you? But you are right, and you you'd think that that's something that it's not natural, but they would, you know, be working on. But yeah. you see those sort of those sort of. Uh, Happen in every team, don't you? The the uh, that happened in the art with catches the art. Can I yeah. can I just ask if if we were to get say a hundred million war chest, would you trust the board to actually spend all that money? I trust or... Matt Hobbs and Gary O'Neill. Yeah, I yeah, I'd one hundred percent trust them. Because but... I think Matt Hobbs has done a fantastic job since he's taken yeah. over. I do think I do think a lot of his work was also down to Lopetegui as well. I think players like Cunha and Saravia. Probably we wouldn't have been able to get if it wasn't for lot pushing. I would th- no, no doubt about that. They backed. This is what people seem to forget. They backed Lopetegui. He was paid ten million pounds. He's paid a lot of money. It's the three times more than any other salary. They gave him all the money that they could. They took money from the summer to give him in last January, and they, you know, they they, they spent a lot of money, and he kept us up, which is great. We were all expecting him to carry on, and then he's walked out on us and done interviews behind the things and like. I've said before, Lopetegui, thank you very much for what you did, keeping us up. But the second you go behind 
behind everyone's back and start using your your buddy to put out Discord and divide the fan base. I can't forgive that. It must be frustrating though if you're if you've. I mean, let's face it. He dropped a level to come to us. I know. All due respect, he did, and it must be frustrating when he's been offered all this. Like, oh, we're going. I don't know exactly what happened, but when he came in, he wouldn't have taken the job if they're like, right, we're just going to be. Um, just going to sit in 17th and you're fine with that. We're you're just going to sit in third. Yeah, but, but, but George, but George with respect, with respect, Lopetegui is still sitting without a job. You mm. know, he's watched Wolves and Gary O'Neill come in without any pre-season with three days, take Wolves to within touching distance of Europe. And he turned around and said this squad wasn't good enough. You know, he bombed out Ray and Aitnori. Nori. I know Chris isn't a fan. But he's been one of our best players this year. I was about to say that there's a re- there is a reason for that, and I've been told that apparently him and Lot didn't get on because he he was consistently late for trying. And I'm not trying to. I heard uh, that as well. Tag, you know, that's fair enough. You you deal with it, you discipline it, but you don't bomb him out of the squad forever. No, of course not. No, no, no I don't agree. With that. You need a player. Like Lopetegui, I've got my views on him. You know, no, fair um, enough. He's fair a great. Enough. He's a good manager. He's a great coach. Thank you very much for keeping us up. You no, got no. you got paid a shed load of money, you got and you walked out on us. You told Matt Hobbs in the tunnel in the Celtic game in Ireland that you're leaving after taking the pre-season. Yeah, he stayed on until we got Gary in, and we got Gary in, and you know he's coming with no pre-season, and he's got us to where he is. And you've got to say fair play to fair play for doing that. Lopetegui could have kept his powder dry and then walked, but no, he got Graham Belaghi, his buddy, journalist, mate, who, by the way, I'd asked him to come on this channel and then he reneged on it when uh, it all went per shape. He did his little behind-the-scenes interviews in a, shady, in, a, in a shady flipping um, bedroom somewhere. And... He's, and they divided the fan base. We had fans against each other. Lopetegui is right. The board of this, the this, that, and it didn't need to be that way. And of course, we we we're now in the situation, obviously down the line, where we've avoided the FFP and the points deduction. Actually, if we, I'll put it like this: we bought in about five players last January, the January before, because we took money. Had we bought in two players in that January because we weren't in a miss and bought in three players in the summer, no one would have said anything. Oh, we've bought mm. in three players, but we couldn't do it. But we're in the situation that we're in. We've got to go past that now. And to me, what happens in the summer is really, really important. Jeff, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on that as well. I mean, on the, the summer coming up from someone that follows very closely Wolves, obviously from far away, but you're, you're a passionate fan. Yeah. Where, it's, where are you? Uh, yeah, it really depends on how much we have to play with. I do think our situation is going to be stronger this summer than it had been. Um, it, it hurt us bringing in Lopetegui and then the, the Ferraris we were trying to buy in the past two summers that didn't pan out killed us. Um, I, I'd like to think we'd get something for Fabio, and I know we're really not going to get anything close to what we paid. Uh, but and Guige like to see us Guige those uh, wages out of us, and uh, I don't really know what players are going to make a major impact when we sell. Neto is probably our biggest talent. And if his injuries were at the beginning of the season and then he ended off really strong, you've got to pay attention to momentum. And right now he's out, he's gone, which in a good thing is we're probably going to have Neto next year. But but if his injuries were just in the beginning of the season and he had a really strong end of season, then I think a, a, a big club would be uh, more Jeff, likely to, to pick Jeff, him up. Which would Jeff, just not. Jeff, just on that, on Neto, don't forget we've got the Euros as well. So if he has a strong Euros, obviously that will bump potentially. But, yeah, but right now, I don't know if it's... You know, yeah. I, I, I don't, yeah, he's not going to give us as much. Kilman could, but not massive. It's not going to be, I don't think we're going to make some major sales. And so I think we're, I, I think that Hobbs is going to be buying smart. And he's been looking at South America a lot and finding some good quality there that we weren't, that weren't at our eyes. 
I'm not saying he's going to go for bargain basement, but I think he's not going to go for the top names and try to do some deal with Barcelona who never pay. It's like, it's like the rich people who stay rich because they never pay their bills. Um, and so why deal with a club like that? So I, I think we're going to find some quality players, but it's not going to be the obvious places. Um, but I really do. Tr- I put a lot of trust in Matt Hobbs and, um, and I'm thinking that she, as long as she is just signing checks for Matt Hobbs and not telling Matt Hobbs what to buy, I think it's going to help us. And if because Gary has done so much with the, with his players and has won them over, now with his involvement on that decision, I think that's I, I I'm feeling a little more comfortable. I don't think we're going to be uh, coming out of the gate super strong and ready to take. Man City head to head to head, but I think we're going to be in a much better position the start of next season than we were in this last one. Fantastic. No, you, no, you, it, we we need to be careful when we slag certain players off. It, we've got a lot of skill in our side now, yeah. the most skill that I've seen since the seventies. We've got a really really skillful uh, squad. If if you play a player out of their natural position. You can make them look really poor. Absolutely. Sarabia, Lamina, uh, Sarabia's skills are, are, are off the charts. If he's played in his right place, he will be massive for us. Well, Lamina, we see what he can do, like the top. Yeah, goal. absolute. Well, with the the Spurs goal set just set it all for me. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that ball was absolutely pinned to him, and he just killed it with his foot. <laughs> so, so we need to be careful that. We're not judging players at the moment because they've, they've been asked to do jobs that, because our squad is so thin, we're, we're asking them to do jobs they wouldn't normally do. And it's making them look bad. And so so we have to be careful that when we're making judgments about players, that some of these guys are playing out of their, their natural position. We need um, silence. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, this is this is the key thing, isn't it? It's all about squad depth and what happens in the summer because we we can see that we're thin on the ground. We need a stronger a stronger bench. We need more depth. Um, the lessons need to be learned of previous things, and we're gonna we are gonna obviously as fans, we are gonna be watching very 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 closely to what happens this summer. And of course, this channel we will be reporting on it, and we will give it opinions and thoughts, and giving you guys. The opportunity to comment, but we do have to give the whole summer window. But it's going to be very interesting to see how how we start the season and what the squad's like at the uh, when the window closes in the summer. And I think that to me is the acid test, and they've got to get it right. And I'm 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 sure Matt Hobbs and Gary O'Neill, you know, have got a plan and the scouting network. You know, you can get some great deals for you know Tommy Doyle will come in for about four point three million. That's a great deal. You don't need to spend 60 million. You can get good players in. But if you know, you look at Brighton, they're a great model. At the point at this time, you have to trade. It's not about being a selling or a buying club, it's about being a trading club. And we've got to trade smarter. If you want to compete, you, you, can't, sell, you can't sell all your best players. You cannot, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. One, one going. I was talking uh, Lucas to Lewis about this after, after yeah, one, one major signing going. Wolves fans will probably accept. Two, there's going to be like, right, what are you going to do with that money? Three, and there's going to be a meltdown. So you, you three know, players who have a big value, and that's Neto, Aitnor, and Gomez. They're the three that have a massive value. And we can't so. sell all three of them for definite. Well, so you can only sell one, in my that's opinion. That's the worry. I wouldn't want to see that happen. You can accept one. Right, we're going to round up, guys, because it's been a, it's been a great show, and it's getting late. Uh, Lucas, uh, Lee Moore, Windows, Man of the Match, uh, Fox at Shooting Performance Rating and your highlight of the day and your score prediction for next week. Against uh, Man of the Match, I'll give it to Nelson because I think he played really well yesterday. He looked a bit tired against Villa, but he looked really good yesterday. Um, the highlight of the day was probably going on the pitch before kick-off uh, to do the Premier League banner. I enjoyed doing that. Yeah. And... Uh, Score prediction for Forest. I'm saying we'll nick it late on one 0 Wolves, and performance right I'll give it a seven point five. Seven point five, uh, Chris. Uh, 
well, I think I said I haven't really changed from yesterday. For me, the man the match was Tommy Doyle. He was 100% effort, putting a good shift in in that that uh, position. He's he's our best best player of the ball. I think in midfield he, he can pass anywhere, and uh, he he was he was running down the wing like uh, Tim Steele at one point. If people remember him, um, and I thought it was a, a good. Um, Good effort by you, and I, I, you know, square pegging around all, but he did a decent job. Um, I don't know why he was taking off. To be honest, it, 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 he 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 could have he could have conserved some energy by playing in midfield after the uh, uh, straight after the start of the second half, and he, he probably could have stayed on the pitch longer. But we, we decided not to do that. Um, match rating six. Um, moment of the day uh i found it quite i found the day quite bad yesterday really it was uh, i didn't really know what to make of the the whole ending of the match that the, the, the var's you don't know what's going on um i think i just enjoyed having a having a sit by my mate there craig in the match and we had we had a good chat in the chin wagon and pointed out why everybody was not very good and <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's a great introduction to you, Craig, to go next. Yeah. Uh, Doc, uh, for me, man of the match. He never stopped running. He saved He saved a certain West Ham goal with a fantastic tackle coming back in the second half. I thought he, he, I thought he never stopped uh, running, finding space, as he always does, a very intelligent player. So, Doc, for me. Um, the performance rating uh, was five because... Seven and a half, eight for the first half, but a very low one and a half, two for the second half. I thought we were awful. Uh, um, my highlight of the day was obviously wagging, uh, wagging odd fellows at uh, the Birmingham Conservative Art Contest. Congratulations on that, yeah. Man. That, 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 that Dave, there's a lot of pressure, and people don't realize they only get one chance, and they've got to go on there un, under pressure with, with a brass instrument on your lips and, and to play. A very, very demanding piece. 14 minutes long, the piece is uh, non-stop. Uh, it's, it's just incredible um, that, that these people have got the courage to do that. So, yeah, that that was my highlight. And, of course, seeing you like, in Tom Walls as well, which I thought was excellent, with a great breakfast that I demolished. Yeah. Mate, I mean, there was a lot. We had uh, the guys from North Carolina there. Yeah. Um, lovely people that watched the channel. They came over, you know, they went to the first game, Dave, Tamara and, uh, and Nicholas. And I think there was 12 of us in there in the end. And if we're starting to take over, they're upstairs. We keep having more people <laughs> joining us every week. But it's uh, fantastic. We, we like our food there. Um, George, down to you now, mate. And have you enjoyed your debut? Oh, I was, I was literally about to say, like, appreciate you so much getting you on. I can imagine you've got so many people who want to have this side, so I really appreciate And you guys have been like great company. You know? There's a lot of Wolves fans I don't agree with, and I've found myself like wanting to pull my hair out tonight, so that's good. But yeah, um, man of the match for me, I, I Nori. I just feel like there's been so much pressure on him to deliver, like as the only sort of outlet re recently. And, you know, I think the reason he came off was because there has been so much pressure on him to like do things that he wouldn't usually do. So I think you've got to give it to I Nori. Match writing for me, I think first half, you've got to give it a nine out of ten because again, we we dominated a much better side than us. But then second half, they just turned it on, didn't they? So I think overall you've got to give it a six six slash seven, because obviously you can't give a loss much higher than that. Um highlight of the day was probably I live in Manchester, you see, so probably the best thing was walking into the train station, the train was right there waiting for me. So oh, you just literally walked fun. on. Yep, platform one as well. Bosh, straight on there. And then Nottingham Forest, um, the, the Forest game. I think we will win. I think Cunha's going to do this to the Forest fans. It's going to be beautiful. I love it. I love it. Absolutely fantastic. And um, finally, Wolfman Jeff. For the, the, all of that, man of the match, performance rating, highlight of the day. Score prediction, and when are we getting you over to Molyneux? Because, like, I want to give you a hug, man. <laughs> I've, like, I've known you for so long. I was saying to, uh, to Dave yesterday, because you got to meet Dave, 
New York day when I was like, I really want to meet Jeff one day because he's like, you know, you're a friend and I've never met you in person, known you for ages, yeah. regular on the channel and part of the international fan. Uh, when do we get you to Molyneux? We need that pilgrimage. Well, I got a kid who's uh, about ready to start college, so that's not helping. Uh, so, but yeah, it's uh, we actually talked to some people yesterday about the possibility. Uh, I'm not sure when it'll be. It'll probably be a January when I come because I know it's so difficult to get tickets, and uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but I figured I'd try to come when uh, when we're our first take in the FA Cup. That way, if I can't get to a league match, I could definitely get in. Get you into a league one. match, Jeff, one yeah. way or the other. We'll get you a but, ticket, Jeff. Don't worry about I talked it. to we'll some people from the club, and they, they're they pretty confident they can make sure I got a ticket. Yeah, so. they, they look after you when you come over. We've got a lot of the South Koreans that come over, and they seem to get tickets. I'm sure you will. Yeah, uh, maybe I could sit with Robert Plant. I, that'd be awesome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was um, – man, the match, I've got to agree with George, and it's Ryan Aitnery. And um, he didn't play the full match, but that's also one of the reasons I pick him as man in that match because the game totally changed when Ryan Aitnuri wasn't on the pitch. And so, as far as for impact, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's uh, others I can highlight. Um, people mentioned Doc, uh, mentioned Semedo, who I think gets under uh, uh, appreciated a bit. But Ryan Aitnuri right now is he's carrying, he's put, you know, he's carrying us on his back a bit. And I think Laminia is doing more than you could see. He's, I think, a, a potential candidate for for captain because yeah. he sees the big picture. And what he's doing isn't necessarily just what helps him, but he's looking at the bigger picture. Um, performance rating, yeah, obviously the first half I was quite pleased insofar as it's not so much I think we played as well. It was we played better than we should have with who we had. And so I was in that's why I was very pleased in the first half. We were driving it and that would raise it up higher. But then the second half, it just, it just kind of fell and done. So yeah, that's where I got to get to like a six and a half. Um, and it, and it drops down tremendously in that, that second half. And then, you know, we were very positive in the first, but second half, it just drops those numbers down. And I hope. Chris is throwing his camera. He's furious about that second half. I love it. The second half. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, if I come, I got to stay at a kicking distance from Chris. So, oh, man. No, his, well, I've only got little legs. If you're all right. Oh, He's there not you go. <laughs> you, Chris and Craig, are like brothers from another mother, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you know. You could be triplets. I it's, it just could be we're old. I don't know. Uh, but we had uh, our experience was different, obviously, because um, I, I got a chance to meet with um, a large group of over fifty Wolves supporters. And when you're used to having to watch it just at home, or occasionally I go to Atlanta and there's maybe six to ten of us there, and we were in places where we were dominant. And 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 even though there were like thousands of people at the fan fest. No one was as organized as we were in Nashville. And we came in, and we, we intimidated. Uh, and we danced and we made fools of ourselves. I and saw you had, doing the last all have a disco. Oh, well, that was, okay, there, they were filming several things. Mostly we were doing chants. But the place we were at, even though it's in Nashville, for some reason we kept playing disco music. And so part of that was we're just realizing the goofiness of this club that's playing disco off in the distance. So that was part of it, but we were having some fun with it. We had, um, I, the fact we're, we are a huge country as far as for distance in the U S and a lot of us are about as far as you are from Athens, uh, yeah. and, you know, and the for us all getting together, um, in one place when we live thousands of miles apart and, you know, people we've built an online community, which is good, but it's kind of like, you know, that day I will come and I will talk with you face to face. I kind of had that with Dave from New York Wolves and the guys from a whole lot of Wolves podcast. And that was really, it was felt like family. And it was, uh, so in spite of how dreadful that match ended yesterday, uh, we then turned to our, our family celebration. So Do you know what, Jeff? That's the thing that we should never forget. We can all have different opinions. We can all get angry and stuff about this. But, like, we're all cutters through with gold and black. We, we support our team. It's 
it's an extended family it's about the community and you cry together you laugh together you know it's not just about the game it's about the whole day and the whole experience and you know it's fantastic for you that you got to get like you'll you'll sit at home and probably watch it at home with yourself and the, and the lady maybe but like for you to get together in a fan fest like that and watch it with 50 Wolves fans reacting and, and I know you'd you'd suffer at the end with the pain and stuff but you could still have a beer with them afterwards and have a chat and a, and a laugh and that made the day for you it wasn't the game was just the almost non-sequential in the fact that you watched it. It was the whole experience for you of getting that. And I really do hope that you can get over to Molyneux, mate, and you can, you know, that that stadium that you... I mean, the guys from North Carolina that came over, we had a couple of guys from Australia as well that came over. They, you know, although we lost the game, walking through the subway, I was talking with me, me and Chris Craig, we were talking to him before the game, we were saying it's a rite of passage as a Wolves fan to walk through the subway and you walk through the subway and you see it all. You know, when I was talking to young Tamara, she's 15, and Nick, Nick who was 17, and they were buzzing from, from, from that experience and then go and get into the thing. And, mate, you need to be there to have that. You, yeah. we, you, we've got to get you over. So I hope you can make it happen because, uh, you know, you, you've been on the channel for like four or five years and I ain't met you yet. So <laughs> we'll get you over. But we um, are real. We are real life friends even though we haven't met in real life so, exactly uh, right and so, uh, you, you can sit down and have a have a, a meal with us before the game and everything as well that'd be amazing so i would say uh next match uh i'm going to be positive not ridiculously positive but i'm going to go for a 2-1 and uh i think and i'm basing that partly <laughs> on the performance in the first half and i think we're going to pull away um, just barely, I think we're due. And uh, as long as uh, as long as Rainey Erie doesn't have uh, uh, his injury wasn't serious, I think we're going to be able to, to pull this next one off. And if I'm wrong, I'll gladly be wrong. Mate, let's hope that we we do hope. And uh, Chelsea will be doing the watch along. So she's done <laughs> four so far for me, and uh, we've, we've not won anyone. So uh, I really <laughs> hope so. Guys, uh, absolutely fantastic. It's been a really long show tonight. Um, if I've sounded like the man out the old tunes advert, like, because I've got a cold now. So apologies for that. But, like, can't let you down. We do the show. Uh, um, George, thanks for making your debut. I hope you'll no come worries. back on. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope, I hope they get on again if, you, if you've enjoyed having me on. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's good to, uh, to get new people coming on and talking and getting a thing and obviously if you've not seen the first half we had johnny phillips on there giving his thoughts as well don't forget about Wembley wonders the links in the description below and of course i will say if you've enjoyed it take one second to smash the like button it lets youtube know that you enjoy it if you're not subscribed why aren't you just hit the subscribe button and uh yeah big thank you to creation wolf um the wonderful people from them who, who help power extra time for us uh we've got a big week coming up we've got forest away next weekend we'll have content coming up all week in regards to that and uh yeah wherever you are watching in the world you know don't lose the faith just because it's a difficult end to the season keep the faith keep your patient keep your powder dry to a point and we will judge and take account of what goes on in the summer. But I do not I do believe that we will win another game before the end of the season. Uh, but whatever happens, we ain't going to be worried about being in a relegation battle like a lot of people predicted. And don't forget that. And Craig, maybe next year, with the back in, that top seven that you were talking about. Yeah. We can get it next year and maybe... It's the forward stage that, 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 that we've lost and it's cost us without any day. So it's yeah, one of those and, not, and you weren't far wrong, mate. Had we not had the injuries, I think we could have done yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, guys, all the best to you. Um, from up, from myself, guys. Ray, cheerful Chris. Cheers, guys. Wolves. All the best. Wolves Seriously, again. Chris Lee. Nice seeing you again, bud. Always yeah. Wolves. Always Wolves. Always Wolves. Always Wolves. <laughs>